Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Track. Uh, we have a very special episode. We have the usuals, myself, Pizza, and Deacon. But we have a fixed gear legend in the building. He's been riding for as long as I can remember, and he's been an inspiration to many people around the world. We have Tyler Johnson. Everybody, round of applause, round of applause. Now, thanks guys. Tyler, uh, for those of you who may not know who you are, uh, how would you describe yourself as a person and how would you describe your relationship with Fix Here? Well, first, thanks for having me on. Uh, stoked to be chatting with you guys. Um, if I were to describe myself, I'm uh, an eclectic, creative person. Maybe. I'll go short. I'm, into, I'm a hobbyist. That's another good way. I get accurate. really into stuff, and when I'm into it, I'm like 100% into it, and nothing else matters. <laughs> and that kind of starts how fixed gears happened. Uh, my buddy Taylor Sizemore had a fixed gear, and I think he showed me like the MASH DVD or something in 2008. And then I rode his bike, and it was like just so sick. You just fell in love with the, the fixed drive chain, huh? Yeah, it was just like, oh, this is... There's just a, I think some people get it when you hop on a fix here, you're like, oh, this feels like you're in sync with the bike. Like there's just something about it that's different than, you know, riding other bikes. And I grew up racing BMX and riding tons of BMX as a kid. So like I've ridden bikes my whole life, but there's something about the way that you feel in a cruise in on a fix here that's different. If you had to list out all of your like, hobbies that you've dived into over the last like 10 years what what hobbies would you include in that list uh i mean fixed gears are definitely on that i've had like an on again off again relationship with freestyle bmx like i've built up and sold like three or four complete bmx bikes <laughs> uh, music for sure been in a couple bands um Mountain biking, got really big into mountain bike. It's normally like a sport. Rollerblading, got super into rollerblading again. I saw that. That was sick. I liked your, uh, I liked your rollerblading phase. It was real nice. <laughs> then, it's not a phase, Mom. Like skate, skateboarding. I'm trying to like mellow it out, though, so I can just do like, oh, I can just go like rollerblade once a month, and it'll be chill, and I don't have to like write everything else off. But yeah, nothing like uh, cars. I got really into cars for a while. Do you find yourself like being into all of them at the same time or do you kind of take turns on all of your hobbies? No, it's definitely like one and that's it. Like what? even with the the bikes behind me, like I got the track bike going again and I was like, sick, this is it. I'm going to mash. I'm going to film a mash part. And then I got the actual mash bike and I was like, this is sick. I'm going to learn all these spinny tricks. And then I built up a fix your freestyle bike. I was like, screw that. I'm just going to ride fix your freestyle. This feels so much more fun. So like, I can't even balance it just across fix gears. Yeah. Can you give us a quick rundown of what, what, the bi what bikes you have behind you? Yeah. So I have, uh, I don't know if you can kind of see the deep wheel. That's a custom size more bicycle track frame that Taylor built for me. I don't know, maybe like 2010 or 11 or somewhere around there. Um, and then I, next to that is my 29er Sizemore Bicycle TT model that I designed back in the day. And then on this side, we have the MASH Neon Fade frame. I don't know what the name of it is. Maybe MASH Steel frame, I think, um, that I just got this year. And then the blue bike is a 26-inch fixed gear freestyle prototype that I had designed and made in 2014 when I was thinking about starting a bike company that I didn't do. Wow. Which one's your, uh, which one's your favorite to ride right now? What have you been riding the most? The 26 inch fix your freestyle for sure. Uh, what's cool is three of the four bikes were custom made for me. So I'm a picky guy. Damn. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're no stranger to designing frames by any means, you know, we've had the, the Sizemore 700C slash 29er frame, the Leader Shadow, the famous Leader Shadow. Um, oh. I actually, first of all, the Leader Shadow was one of my favorite bikes. I remember seeing it in my local city grounds bike shop and thinking, damn, I want that someday, but it was $600. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, what's the story behind uh, you getting sponsored by Leader, and uh, how did it end up in a signature frame for you? I don't really remember how it came about that I got sponsored by Leader. I had just broken my Trek TK1. Is that what the Trek is? TR1? I can't remember what it was, but my Trek aluminum frame that I rode for like the revival and like sessions and stuff like that. And then maybe I reached out and was like, hey, you know, do you guys have anything? Um, and I first got one of the Leader 735s, which is like the super arrow one that had like the yeah, triangle yeah, with... head tube on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. So uh, I rode that and I, that's the one that I did like a bar spin over a skateboard to wheelie on. It was like that funny arrow frame. And then they came out with their TRK steel frame. And that was super sick. It was like the only steel bike that I was like even into at that time. I was, I'm always like really slow to change. I was like the, besides J-Ball, I was the <laughs> slowest person to change in fixed gear probably. <laughs> True. True. I held uh, out for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And then I think, you know, just kind of like fixed gear was evolving so fast at that time. Because that was probably what, like. 2010 maybe i don't know when did that shadow video come out 2011 i think the shadow came out in 2010 yeah so like like new frames are just dropping constantly and the leader came out with like the trk that cleared like 32c and then went up to like 38c and then maybe it went up to like 40 something c and i was just like let's just jump to the end of the spectrum and build the bike that's going to clear the biggest tires that you can fit on it and that's kind of where the shadow came out. So, you know, I, I had seen those mountain bike yokes that they do, which I think Master Bike Co. has on theirs now. Um, so we took that as kind of inspiration. I was, you know, taking inspiration from like 90s BMX frames with the wishbone chainstay. And, uh, yeah, I really didn't want to have that, like, uh, gusset, the leader gusset on it. But it was, like, and out of my hand. That was, like, the one thing that I didn't really get to do exactly how I wanted. But yeah, I came up with the geometry and stuff and Terrence. I don't know if you guys remember Terrence. Uh, heavy pedal? Yeah, heavy pedal Terrence, yeah. He helped uh, with the design of the graphics and stuff. I I was like really into mutiny and stuff at that time. Mm. It was like really modern, clean typeface. And then I was like uh, doing a, had like a dream catcher design uh, for the stickers. Right. Can I ask, can I ask why it didn't come with an integrated headset? I was always curious about why all the leader trick frames when they first came out didn't come with integrated headsets. Yeah. So this was a little bit before people started doing that. Um, It might've been like right around the same time, but the thing with the integrated head tubes is um, most of the time, all of the head tubes end up being the same length. Mm -hmm. So you have, and this is when we're still doing three sizes of frame. So you're doing a small frame, a medium frame, and a large frame, right? And so like the difference between a small and a large head tube was probably like four or five centimeters in length. And so if you look at like a lot of the frames that had integrated head tubes at that time, they like get kind of weird top tube angles because the head tube is the same length on all the sizes, right? So then you get like a large frame that basically has like a horizontal track top tube. And then the small frame has like a sloping one. We're we were just trying to make them like all look the same. They just kind of like size down. Whoa, that's cool. I never even thought of it that way. Dude, I remember the the leader hurricane having the tiniest little head tube. Do you guys remember? Yeah, and that? that was probably integrated, <laughs> right? Probably. I don't know. I've actually never yeah. really seen one in person. <laughs> Dreams was also, I think, integrated, and his was shorter, more of that like kind of. I just think of like the grime frames. Like that hor- is like a fixed gear freestyle, but it's still like a horizontal top tube. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then some of them, some of them were like almost pursuity, like the unknown V two. That was like a pursuit frame. Oh, terrible! <laughs> oh, weird. No one wants to do tricks on that. Uh, and is it is it true, Tyler, that you had to end up changing the name of the shadow? Yeah. So, uh, shad- the shadow conspiracy sent a cease and desist letter to Leader Bikes. Uh, <laughs> They were just, like, really not into fixed gear stuff, which bums me out, too, because they were one of my favorite brands, for sure. I think I even had shadow grips and pedals Wait. on my build of the shadow. Wait, that makes yeah. no sense, because they, they made fixed gear bars. You guys remember that? 
Well, they made a FGFS complete. Shadow? Sabrosa did? No, Sabrosa did. Yeah, Sabrosa did. We're talking about yeah, Shadow. I don't know. Company. I think they're just like, I mean, if we had actually gone to court and like called their bluff on it, we would have been fine. They were Shadow Conspiracy doesn't make frames, right? Yeah. Ours was just the Shadow and not Conspiracy. You know, like, right. yeah. The, in terms of right. like, you know, leader playing, paying legal fees to like fight on this, whatever. We didn't change anything. The bike came with stickers that said shadow. All we changed is they just took the shadow off of their website and called it like Tyler Johnson miniature frame or something. Yeah, it was crazy. I was like, yeah, I was bummed when that first happened. Then I just didn't care. Yeah, that's that's pretty shitty. Like, it's such a small, like, it, it's such a small community that it's like, why? There's no point in attacking us. We're not... <laughs> We're not imposing on your shit. And also they made they made like trickster uh copy copycat bars like for fixed gear riders, so that's just yeah. stupid. Uh and then so that was two thousand ten that the whole sh- let the shadow came out and then how long were you I guess riding for them until you like why did you leave leader? Yes, yeah, so I think I rode for them for like two years probably. Um, which felt like in fixie years, it's fixie years is kind of like dog years, especially in that time frame. Like <laughs> two years is like seven different iterations of a frame, probably like multiple yeah. tire sizes. Yeah. You went from a track bike to a 29 er frame. Sizes. Yeah, exactly. So I literally, I went from a 650 C with 23 C tire to when I left them, I was riding a 2.1 continental. 29 or front tire you know what i mean so a lot changed in those two years but the biggest thing was like um i've always been like super into made in the usa stuff i just think it's cool and um the timeline on taiwanese uh manufacturing is just super long like to get a prototype made it took like six months and then to do a run was like another six months and i totally get it like I mean, just the boat ride from the factory to the States is like over a month, right? So right. Um, I just knew like fixed gear needed to iterate a little bit quicker. And I viewed that, I viewed my way of doing that as like partnering with things that could be made in the USA a little bit more quickly and a little bit more small batch. It doesn't really get more small batch than making one frame and se- and putting a pre-order for it that nobody buys. So, you know, <laughs> a pretty small batch. That was that was Sizemore, right? Yeah, the Sizemore. So that's the one over at the NS bars. So I rode that one at the twenty twelve no two thousand eleven riding style. That's right. That's right. Where you got? Did you get second or third place at that one? Third place. Yep. Third place, which, in my opinion, is debatable. You did some insane shit that that competition you did a tire ride bar on the on the thick rail the disaster on the huge quarter pipe like dude insane stuff at the time yeah Uh, i think it's because i didn't land that gap to pedal feeble i got that in the heats or whatever like because it was a weird format it was like 10 minute jam session for qualifying but then the finals i think were just a run right something like that that's how i remember it at least so like give me 10 minutes to try a trick and I'll probably land whatever it is. You know, like I got to try that gap to pedal, pedal feeble like 15 times after I had landed all my other stuff. So it's like, I'm not going to be able to necessarily do that in one try the next time. And I think I tried it at the end of the run, but you're so gassed at the end of those runs that right. trying to pull something big, that you have to like use a lot of effort for, but yeah, man, I was pumped. I didn't even think I would be anywhere close to the top. I didn't even know that I had qualified first until somebody posted the picture on Facebook like two years later or something. <laughs> wow. Uh, what a, I feel like, um, w- would you consider yourself like a competition rider or more of like like an all-around dude, an edit rider? Like what, what do you classify yourself as? Because I feel like I didn't see you go to very many events over the years. So I, I'm very competitive. For sure uh if i'm put into a competitive environment well actually i'll take that back i'm just competitive <laughs> like even at the skate park right if somebody's like trying to trick and you know i love like grabbing people's skateboards and like doing the trick that they're trying just to like 
you know. Toxic. Like, so, he's that guy. <laughs> people Damn. I know. People I know. Not like random no. people. It'd be really funny if it was like random. The guys, that, the guys that are at my local park every day that I know, you know, like, you know, they're giving me a hard time about something, whatever. I'm like, well, let me see your port. Uh, so I'm definitely, like, super competitive. I think that comes from, like, racing BMX growing up, right? But I'm not competitive in a sense of, like, outside of doing what I'm doing. Like, I don't feel competitive. I didn't feel competitive towards other writers and their edits, like Tom and those guys. Like, I love watching their stuff. It got me so hyped. It wasn't like, oh, man, they got sponsored by this. Like, that should have been me. That's not really how I can think, how I think. But, like, if I see somebody do something really cool, it gets me really hyped to, like, throw down and just, like, go for it. So that's in that sense of, like, I'm competitive. I really like being in presser, pressure situations. So, like, Red Bull everybody watching you know that's a i mean there's a lot of people with those so like having that's most people that's ever watched me ride before probably you know um yeah i I thrive under that stuff i love it uh so if you if you love this so much i was surprised i didn't see you at um a lot of the other bigger events like you know like summer fix and midwest mayhem and stuff where everyone else was kind of flocking to at the time how come you didn't make it out to those ones uh, I mean, I tried to start my own bike company, so I didn't have any sponsors, <laughs> really. Now, I mean, H Plus Sun was a sponsor during that time frame, and they were always great to me. But I was going to school full-time, working part-time, and, you know, like living an hour away from where I go to school and work. So I didn't have, like, a ton of free time. And then even the riding style ones... Uh, I wouldn't have been able to go to those, but Red Bull flew me down and like put me up in a hotel for him. So I was like establishing a relationship with the Red Bull rep up here in Seattle and they were super cool to me, um, to get me down to those. And like I said, I don't feel like I'm a contest person, but I really am bummed that I miss on the experience of riding with every, like Midwest mayhem for sure. Like those just are such iconic events and. Yeah, I was always super bummed, but yeah, I just didn't have the money to fly out and go to them and stuff. That makes sense. I feel like I remember I remember watching those back in the day. You know, I'm in high school in 2011. I'm like, I think I'm a I'm like a sophomore or junior in high school at the time, and I remember thinking like, damn, like Tyler John. If only Tyler Johnson was at Midwest Mayhem too. Like that would have made that would have literally made it the ultimate event because almost everybody was there. You had yeah, Lamar- that one I should have I should have been. <laughs> Man, it sucks. Lamarche, Wonka, uh, Antonio. Name. <laughs> so like, crazy. Congo. B though with the freaking nose manual up the stairs. Yup. Yeah, that dude. Trend that dude's setter. crazy. He's so right? far ahead of his time. <laughs> yeah, bring murder. Bring murder. Be back. Uh, Kareem or maybe Matt. I don't know. One of them actually saw uh, saw him recently. Uh, Pop quiz. Do you remember his yeah. real first name? <laughs> Colin, his name is Damn. Colin Burr. Uh, anyways, <laughs> what was that pizza? I said he just doxed him on on, on, on live right now. <laughs> it's, not, it's not doxing; it's his name. <laughs> He's not trying to hide his identity. Um, so, 2011, you're on Sizemore. Why did your Sizemore not get any pre-orders? That's so insane to think about uh it was really expensive it was like honestly for what it was a handmade frame by one guy like who just it's like basically a custom bike uh it what it's not expensive right i mean he was selling frames for like two to three thousand dollars at this point in time and i think we were selling it for like 7.99 or something i don't know i have to go back and look at like the pre-order post that we did, but it was, I think it was like seven to $900 somewhere in there. Cheaper than so the gorilla. Really expensive. Yeah. Really expensive. And then I think it was just like, everyone was going 26 at that point. So like I said, you know, I was a little slow to make changes. If I had made it a 26 inch bike at that point, it probably would have sold better. But you know, that's what Skylimit ended up being. Right. And did you, did you switch to 26 inch because you wanted to, or because that was like the, the opportunity in front of you? Uh, I, I probably could have designed a 29 er for sky limit if that's what I wanted to do. Um, but 
I think it was just like, you know, writing's on the wall. Everyone's running in 26. And then you ride at 26 right. and you're like, oh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> like, even when I just got this bill up again and like went and wrote it, I was like, damn, this thing's so hard to 180. It's like long. <laughs> the arrows, too, have like such high rotating mass. Like, I don't even know how yeah. I bar spun on the damn thing. It's like insane. <laughs> the, the wheel just wants to stay straight. You could just like go stride the bike for it. Ever. It would just keep going. To touch on that, I feel like you're the reason, you and Steven were the reason why, like, all of us wanted H plus Sun stuff so bad. Like, for real. I blame you for, for making me spend all my money on building up a fucking <laughs> Euro wheel set. Hey, man. Hey. They were bomb proof, though. Like, I don't know very many people yeah, that blew were. up arrows. They were strong wheels. Especially if you put a big tire on it. Yeah, I think they, they were the strongest. Have- they had the coolest colors too. Like, don't get me wrong, the the velocity Anno, stuff, red and purple yeah. and stuff. Hey. The H plus Sun color was so much better. Mm-hmm. It was so sick. I can't tell you how many roll off pinch flats I've gotten because of your because of Eros back in the day. <laughs> It just like high PSI, man. It just it didn't work if you weren't good at riding. (laughs) Like I wasn't. I was landing all my stuff really sloppy at the time and like under rotating stuff, and I would just get pinch flats so much. But now I have eros on like some of my bikes, and I don't have that problem anymore because I can land straight. Yeah, Stevens were crazy because he he ran he switched to twenty six pretty early, and so he had the twenty six inch arrows, which were like crazy because the spokes were basically like bmx length spokes yes. in the wheel made them right so strong it's yeah insane. it was wild and then but he even was running even wider tires like at the time arrows were pretty wide for a rim mm-hmm. like most rims were like 19 i think they're like 23 or something which is like so narrow compared to any actual freestyle rim and then even now road rims are like 26 millimeters wide like everything's just gotten so wide over the last few years but like back then you know, it seemed like it was wider, like, damn, yeah, I can put a 2.1 on this thing. And now it's like, oh, my gosh, I don't even know. How. There's so much bulge around. It's like this tiny little rim and then this huge balloon. But that's kind of what makes them look sick, too. Right. Yeah, they do have a look. I remember Steven ran the big-ass Surface Drifter, Surface Drifters on them. Is that the one that has, like, the the treads, like, imprinted into it? Like, reverse yeah. tread, almost? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and it farts when you turn. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it would skid forever. It would turn, like, uh, red, and then it would turn yellow afterwards. That's when you knew you were like, all right, maybe I need to get a new tire. Damn, was, I don't think I've ever cool. skidded through a big tire. I don't even I don't even commute anymore. I can't remember the last time I skid through a tire. <laughs> <laughs> so bad uh so you put out your sky limit video in 2012 i believe to promote your skyscraper bars um how did your relationship with sky limit like how did that happen and then um i guess how did you how did you like the sky limit bars and why did also why did sky limit never really like pick up off the ground what happened there yeah, so at the 2011 ride in style, um, I may have been talking with Colby a little bit before that. So Colby Elric, um, I can't remember the other guy who filmed uh, part of it. I mostly just talked with Colby, so that's that was the main person I knew. Was it also uh, Colin Arlen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah, the Macaframa uh, dudes. Yeah, yeah. So they were they were all friends. Like Colby helped. I mean, Colby obviously like filmed a lot of Macroframa. I think he might even be in one of them. Um, but I think in my runs at Riding Style on the Sizemore, I'm wearing a Sky Limit shirt. So we had already at that point established like me and Steven were on the team. I think we. I had maybe even already designed the frame. I'm not sure. Like when nobody bought the Sizemore, I was like, all right. This time, this is not where fix your free. This is not the direction fix your freestyle is going. So, you know, if I want to be continuing to be involved in like shaping what people are writing and stuff, that's the next thing. So, I designed the Sky Limit frame, the SL1, and then I helped with Steven's frame, just kind of like figuring out some of what he wanted with the geometry and stuff. Definitely wanted a very different bike than what I was looking for. So, 
uh, yeah, just I designed the sky limit frame, um, and then I designed the handlebars. Handlebars were a little less. I don't, I don't know if I'd actually call it designed. I, I requested the handlebars at a certain height and width, and we just had somebody make them that could make handlebars. You know what I mean? I would have liked them to be a little bit smoother, kind of like the NS bars, where they're like you know a little Ooh. shape. But the sky limit was like a little sharp, and then a little sharp. I definitely think it looked like like a crazy freestyle motocross bike, which is kind of yeah. Sick. Those I thought the sky limit bars looked really cool. I just saw a lot of which people. They were bend crazy. Them. Yeah. Yeah. The which thing is- that's. <laughs> Yeah, the thing that's crazy about them is like I rode the prototype. I'm I'm actually probably a bad person to test stuff. I like don't break things really ever. Oh, that must be and nice. So like I rode the prototype bars for three I don't know three four weeks maybe two months, no problems at all. And then so I was like, yeah, good to go. Let's make them. Little did I know, Tom Lamar spent his in like a week. Oh man! Oh, shit. And so I bet, I bet mine. Yeah, every every person that has them bent them for sure. Which it's, it, uh, it's, 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 it's the it too good idea. It's, a, it's a, I'm too good, so it, nothing's gonna break. <laughs> but I bent them in my sky limit part, so that <laughs> clip where I ride up the stairs and then jump off that big drop. Bend my handlebars right there. So I'm like in the middle of filming this edit to like help release these bars. And I'm like calling Colby being like, dude, they just like, I just bent these pretty bad. And he's like, oh yeah, a couple other people have bent them too. I'm like, why don't you tell me that? So it wasn't ideal. You know, it's just one of those things. I think people, I don't know, you know, in that period too, though, it was like kind of commonplace for like new stuff to come out people to ride it for a bit and break it because we were pushing beyond what we what we were doing six months before. Like, the progression was so fast. Yeah. You know, I would have yeah. loved to have made bars that didn't bend. But yeah. like I said, again, I just told them, like, I want a four-inch tall, no crossbar handlebar that right. has this much back sweep. Like, I didn't really get to, like, be as involved in that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, don't get me I, wrong. They were sick. But it yeah, was just for like, sure. <laughs> for sure. I love. They, they were like, so they were crazy. crazy congoloids. They were like crazier congoloids, which were awesome. But I think, I, I think when those came out, they were kind of like on the tail end of the risers, kind of like taking their, taking their, slow, life. slow to evolve, yeah. man. Yeah. I feel- they were, they were, they were on their way out for sure. Because I think after that, everyone else kind of was like, all right, we're just going to make BMX bars, but just like five inch or like that was when we started to just like the rise of our handlebars were just taken off. And so, yeah, when I, those handlebars are wild. (laughs) When I think about it though, like the bar, this, the like bars at the time that those came out, none of them were really that reliable. Like congoloids also bent and broke unknown bars would always bend. And those had a crossbar. (laughs) The and unknown bars it, came but, broken, but, dude. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Saudio Sa- hot bars. Saudio hot bars would bend. Saudio four twenty bars would snap. <laughs> so yeah. I, so I think you know everything was breaking then, but like w- I mean, ours were made by solid BMX. Like they made our bars for us. You know what I mean? So we're like we're trying to like make them good. You know, we got a BMX company make these handlebars for us. So we figured that their tubing and stuff would be strong enough and up for it, but. You know, like the NS bars that I have, I mean, they're like 10 years old and they're not bent at all. So you can make a tall riser bar that's good, but you have to do custom drawn tubing, right? So it's like, it's not just a bent tube. It's like thicker where the bends are. And, you know, right. like you have to spend a lot of money on that. And that's hard to do for a little upstart company like Skyrim, right? right? Uh, and then I, I don't think we ever established. Uh, so that uh, Sizemore 29er you have is your original one from 2011 right yep and only one ever made and still strong i mean the bike is sick dude it's so crazy like so sick we made it so strong and it's super light and the geometry is awesome you don't get any toe overlap but it's not like too long dude it should have been if if i'd released it a year earlier and maybe the price was a little bit cheaper i think it would have done well but yeah same bike it's great, and great condition. I rode it for years as a single speed mountain bike. We had disc brakes welded to it at one point. And how did you? How did you get? Tell the people how you got it back because you've already told me this, but they need to know. Uh, I got that one back. I mean, did, I thought you said Chris. Chris had it. Oh yeah. So, 
at some point, I, like, gave it back to Taylor Sizemore. I mean, he built it and gave it to me. Like, I didn't pay for any of the tubing. He was, he was a partner in us trying to do this. Uh, great friend. Um, awesome bike builder. I wish he was still building bikes. But anyway, so I, I was like, I'm not riding this anymore. Skyline thing was going. So I gave him back the frame. He then welded disc brakes to the frame and the fork. It has a uh, brake brake 17 fork. Um, Jacob would know which model it is. but So they welded disc brakes to it. Made it a single speed mountain, cross country mountain bike with like a long stem and flat bars and stuff. And then I got it back from him at some point, you know, over the last 10 years. And then I gave it back to him. And then it, he gave it to Chris Clappé, aka The Butcher, uh, who now we live like five minutes apart from each other down in Tacoma. Oh, so sick. So he, he like moved with it. Or maybe I got it back. I don't know. I can't remember, but he, he's had it. So it's been in his garage the past couple of years. Uh, I think once I got a real mountain bike, I was like, I don't need this thing. Do you want to ride it? Um, and then, yeah, so I just grabbed it back from him, like, what, two and a half months ago, maybe? We uh, well, uh, chopped off all the brake mounts and the cable guides, wow. sanded it down, and got it built back up. That's so cool. <laughs> also, I never realized that it's Chris Clap A, not just Chris Clap. That's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's an accent on it. I don't know, but yeah, it's Clape. Does he does he uh, ever think about coming back to riding bikes? Have you inspired him at all? Yeah, we're definitely gonna ride soon. So I mean, I don't know that he'll like build up a new bike, but I was like, dude, you can ride the size more. You can ride my twenty six. Let's go. So um, next time, like Jacob comes down to Tacoma. So I live like in Tacoma, um, which is maybe how how far is Long Beach from L.A. It's about uh, 30 minutes. 40 more. Yeah, yeah, about the same. So it's like a 35-minute drive if there's no traffic, you know, whatever. So that's mm. to Seattle, Tacoma to Seattle. Um, and so Chris lives down here. Jacob and Kareem, they live up in Seattle still. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely planning to get out with Chris. I know he wants to ride. I've been sending him some of the videos. And, like, we, we just love going back and watching, uh, like, our old CSK videos. Because it's just us hanging out. And it's, like, a fun... You know, like just some of the sh- some of the stuff in them is just like cracks me up. Like there's this one where Jacob's filming or something, and he had to use Chris's phone. And Chris is like, "What's wrong with your phone?" And Jacob's like, "It's full." And Chris's <laughs> response is like, "You have an iPhone." Like his mind is blown that the iPhone is out of store. I don't know, just little things like <laughs> it's not even about the writing as much as just like that stuff or like Chris laughing in the background or whatever. It was just a great time, but. Yeah, so he's definitely going to ride, and I'll get some clips when he does. That'd be awesome. I remember he um, the last footage I ever saw of Chris was in, uh, in Stay Strapped. He was riding some 26-inch build with a brake. Does he still have that bike, or what bike was that? Yeah, so Chris and I both rode for Hold Fast at the end there. So that he had been riding the Hold Fast 29er probably um, previous to that. Oh, he, he was riding for All City for years, and then he rode for Hold Fast. And then that was a hold fast subverter, which was their 26 inch frame. Um, oh. So that was his last fixed gear freestyle bike. And then he sold that to Kareem at some point. Kareem has bought most of like all of our old bikes. He has a pretty good fixie collection going on. But Kareem built that up for like some girlfriend that he had at the time. And she still has it, I guess. Like a single speed, I'm pretty sure. Have, um, you, have you seen Kareem since you've been riding again? Yeah, we were just rode... Uh, it was either last weekend or two weekends ago. He came out with us. We had a, a crew of like three BMX guys and then me, Kareem and Jacob, and we were filming stuff. Um, yeah, it was fun. That's so sick. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, the CSK crew was, you know, you, Chris, Jacob, and I feel like Kareem was always kind of like doing his, his own thing. And also, wasn't Steven uh, Jensen in Seattle, too, for a while? Yeah, he definitely was. Um, Steven lived over in Redmond, so it's just like you have to cross a, a bridge on the other side of Lake Washington. I don't know if you've ever been to Seattle, but basically there's like the Puget Sound on one side, Seattle, this really big lake, and then another like area that's called the east side. And so Steven lived over on the east side. Um 
I like rode with Steven a few times at future tense events, but I don't think we like ever rode together. Kind of, Steven kind of had like his own group that he was riding with and doing stuff with, which is so funny because we like had the same wheel sponsor. We live like 25 minutes. Yeah. Well, also at this time though, I was living in Gig Harbor, which is like an hour and 15 minutes away from Seattle. So yeah, like man. really I wasn't when, when Steven was still living up here, I wasn't up. I wasn't uh, close. Yeah. That um, and then Kareem didn't sense. move until like, he said he's been working at Boeing for ten years now. So Cream moved to Seattle in twenty twelve. Okay, so he wasn't he wasn't there before that. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you, I was, I was, I'm, I was always surprised because you and Steven had not just the same wheel sponsor, but you also both rode for Skylimit. So right. I was. That was after he had moved, though. He had lived in Phoenix by the time he was riding for Skylimit. Oh, uh, okay. I'm pretty sure okay. he didn't live in S- Seattle at that point. Maybe he like visited one time. I feel like I rode with him on a Skylimit at one point, but yeah, he was kind of past. But yeah, th- I think that kind of takes us back to the Skylimit thing of like. So we made the bars. Everybody bent their bars, but I mean, we sold like I don't know how many of them. We made a hundred, maybe something. We like made a f- you know fair amount of them. People were hyped on it. Like I felt like. Sky Limit was a pretty exciting thing for a lot of people. I mean, it's really exciting for me to get to design stuff, have them made. Um, and, you know, I filmed my Sky Limit part in like a month to get it done so that we could release something. And that was like, you know, self film some of it. It was like a mission to get that thing done. I had like a trick yeah. list and they were only like the hardest things I could think of. It was that's, like no, the, you know, no filler. That's a gnarly month <laughs> to get all that, all that footage in a month. <laughs> like having watched that edit like t- 10, 12 times, it's like that's crazy that you did that in a month. Yeah, right. I mean, that's why I have like the same outfit on the whole, vi- the whole video. I have like gray hoodie, gray shirt, basically on in every clip because I we I tried to film as much in a day as I could because it also was filmed in November in Seattle, right? Oh. So like. <laughs> If in that month, I probably only went out and rode five times, maybe. Oh, five or six times. Right? So it's like, get as much as you can while you're out. I mean, there's a there's a nose manual clip in there on a ledge where I kind of like built a little kicker up to the ledge. Because the ledge is pretty tall. Mm-hmm. There'd be mm-hmm. no way to bunny hop up it to nose manual. But it, the length of the ledge was like, this is a long nose manual. It'll be sick if I can clear it. That, like, I drug that wood down from my house, like, 15 blocks oh, down to that no spot in the rain it was raining i just set my gopro on the edge of this bench oh, yeah. and just basically tried that by myself in the rain because that was like maybe one of the last clips that i had on my trick list of like i want to know this manual that ledge and uh man i ate shit trying that and nobody was even there because it was like pouring down rain in a park but i just committed to like getting it done at, at least you fell forward into grass yeah that's the benefit of that that spot. It's so hurt. It knocked the wind out of me. And not only but if that had been concrete, it would have been Oh yeah, god. For sure. For not sure. not only did you film that entire part in a month, you also were were releasing quick clips leading up to that edit, right? Yeah, so we were learning how to use the I bought a GoPro. Of course it was like a GoPro three and then the four came out literally a week later. Of course. So like I bought the best GoPro that was out and then they immediately came out with another one. But I bought like <laughs> you know, those little mini steady cam things for the GoPros, you know? So yeah. Chris and I were trying to figure out how to use them, like how to get the weight right so that you could actually use it. And then I didn't, I mean, I'm not very tech savvy. So like, I didn't know how to export them right. So I was trying to like learn how to get them off the thing in and up onto video in more than like 240p, you know what I mean? So we were, we got the GoPro and we're kind of like filming, trying to figure it out. And then kind of once we got it figured out, um, and a lot of those quick clips were before I got the sky limit bars. So they were on the, the build as it came from Interbike. So the bike that was displayed at Interbike was my actual frame. So they displayed it and then they sent it to me. Um, and so I changed a few things on it once I got it, but, um, so I was kind of waiting to get like the bars made and then start really filming. That yeah. The sense. quick clips was, was fun. It was fun to like. You know, just throw little teasers of stuff out there, funny videos. Pre pre Instagram. Yeah, that's basically what it was. Yeah, keep people like excited about this thing that's to come. Quick 
quick clip, TTV quick clip. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah, those, those are sick. And then, uh, yeah, did the edit, put the B-sides afterwards. I don't feel like too many people were doing that as much back then of like, here's just stuff. And it wasn't the... Well, it wasn't really any of the ones that we used. It was all the extra clips. I don't know if that's how they're normally all done, but that's that's how I wanted to do it then. Um, just because, like, I had um, maybe, like, somebody's flip camera, too. So I was, like, trying to do two nice. angles on certain things. Nice. Uh, yeah. Real real bad quality stuff, but... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, did you did you edit the sky limit part yourself, or who or who had edited that? No, so I just sent Colby and um, just emailed them all the clips, and I said, "This is the song that I want." Like I said, I was super into Mutiny, and I think Mutiny probably used like Black Angels songs on some of their edits and stuff. Um, and so I was like, "This is the song I want." I was just telling Jay Ball the other day, I'm like, I'm really watching it now. I'm like, this was edited terribly. Like, <laughs> I don't land on the beat on anything. None of the cuts from clip to clip are on the beat. And not that, like, everything has to be, like, perfectly in time, but it makes it so much more impactful. It was just like, here's the clip, here's the clip, here's the clip, like, over the song. So, I'm watching it back now. I'm like, dang. But I was so proud of that at the time. Like, you know, I got, I talked with Prawley to get it uh, an exclusive launch on... I think it wasn't even the Radivus, so probably not, is not probably at that time on Christmas Day, you know, it was Damn. like this big thing that we built up and then it got posted on the come up, which was like crazy. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was super proud of it at the time. Now watching it, I'm like, dang, I wish this was edited a little bit differently. But at the time, I was just super proud on like getting all the tricks that I wanted to get done, pushing myself. Yeah, let's let's call out some highlights there. First of all, the whole the whole edit was pegless. That's really sick. Uh, you had that. You had the giant. Was it a bump jump? Did that bent your bars, or did you just jump over that little little ledge? I just jumped it. Yeah, I kind of maybe bump jumped it, but that it was like an eight or nine foot drop. It was pretty big. That's that's would be super gnarly to bump jump. I actually thought this whole time that was a bump jump. Damn, still sick though. Uh, you like rode you rode the big uh the big bowl. You had some a good nose manual in there. The pegless pegless pegs down the uh down the handrail. That's insane. You're a crazy person. Why do you run no pegs? What's wrong with you? Yeah, I mean, pegs on bikes without crossbars to me is like not the style. Is it, Gus Gus does it. That. Gus is maybe like the only person that kind of rocks it. But it just like wasn't my thing. I was like I said, I was always slow, right? Everyone's putting pegs on. No, I'm not into that. I'll just keep doing like my thing that I've been doing, right? And then I got into like pegless shit because like Hoder is doing pegless grinds and stuff. And so the way that I set that up to make myself commit to going that's the first that was the third handrail that I'd ever hit pegless. So I did, in in one of the cl quick clips, I think, there's me doing, like, a really tall but, like, mellow handrail. I did, like, two of them in a row, and I kind of, like, jumped off and then, like, did a rollerblade grab down off this thing, whatever. So, like, I'd, I'd kind of been getting into them. And at this time, I had a BMX with pegs, so I could, like, peg, I could do a double peg really good. So it wasn't, like, I actually don't view pegless double axles as any different than doing a pegged. <laughs> Right, it's the same thing. You like just aim to land on your hub. Oh man, um, not can't uh, relate, bro. Uh, <laughs> you're just built different. <laughs> the way, yeah. The way that I set it up though is in that clip where I hit the down rail. I think it's like a 10, 10 or eleven stair down rail. I put a bike rack one full crank before it, so that you have. I hopped over the bike rack, so that I, I had to have enough speed to clear over the bike rack. And yep. land, but then I, if I did it, I didn't really have enough time to stop. So it kind of like forced me to just do do it, oh, and then one full crank and then send it on the rail. And I got it, I think, two tries. The first one I landed on my ass, I missed the back and landed on my ass, and then I got it on the second try and then didn't try it again. There you go. There you actually, go. Actually, actually, wild. And then yeah, that one was good. And then I think the, the hop over the railing was another. Oh, wheelie 180 bar. Oh. I think I was the first person on fix here to do that. That time. Yeah, wheelie, I I think so. Switch too. Ooh. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I hadn't seen anybody do that. Yeah, I did switch Wheelie 182. So that's why I mean, I was really trying to do things that other, and that's kind of maybe like that competitive side, but I was really trying to do stuff that I, I hadn't seen anyone else do yet on fixed gears. Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, I had like on my list, Wheelie 180 bar, Wheelie Switch 180. Right. And like, even back then, not many people were doing them on BMX. I remember Adam 22, that was one of the things he like called out on it when he was, it was like right up on the come up was like, yeah, I mean this, you know, you hate on fixies all you want, but this kid's also kind of doing stuff that like not many people are doing on BMX. So Dude, that I, felt cool to like even get a little bit of recognition of like, you know, people I, seeing that. Right. I totally forgot that that edit got posted on the come up, and uh, he kind of praised you. Of comments. Huh? He 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 said good things. Yeah, the comments didn't say great things, but he said decent. Like he didn't he yeah, didn't really like, shit on it. Yeah, but yeah, like, we, it, we like had so many haters back or whatever. Fixie. Fifty. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he he actually was like, he was kind of talking in general about fixed gear stuff. I think a lot mm -hmm. of what it post. I don't think it's up anymore, so I don't know how it would go look. But I remember him saying something like, "The guys that are good getting good at fixed gear actually are making it look pretty decent." Like that was you know coming from a BMX website, somebody to say like, "This guy's making it look pretty good," and he's doing stuff like manual 180 bar. They called it a manual. I called it a wheelie, but uh, you know. And not many people on BMX are doing it at the time. Like that made me feel like sick. I'm I'm pushing the boundaries of what we're doing. Do you know off the top of your head what other NBDs you have in the book? Death truck or fixed gears? Uh, I don't know. If, I think like, you know, at that time it was like first person to bar spin a six stair. Uh, you know, like it wasn't. We were like it was like small stepping stones. I were you the first person to do a hop? bar spin wheelie probably yeah because i did over the skateboard on that 735 it, that was your bike that's nuts on a track <laughs> that's bike. crazy <laughs> what the fuck and yeah, full the thing that's crazy to me is i was running full seat extension back then too so i don't even know how i was like honey hopping where where is that clip it's on taylor's liquor I just found it the other day. I'll send it to you. Taylor's Flicker. I'll find it. I can dig. Yeah, Taylor, I can dig Tay, this it's up. It's like his 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 Flicker name is like Ye Tay, like Tay backwards, Tay forwards. I'll 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 find it. Or I'll ask I'll ask you to send it to me so so the people can see. It's called NBD on there. So yeah, it was uh that was an NBD <laughs> at that point. There you so, go. I don't know. I don't remember like you know. I was probably the first person to do a crank arm on a fix gear. Um. That was in Long Beach, and I just destroyed myself on that fat rail. Oh. Oh, I remember that. You did that on the Shadow. Right? Was no? It the no, Sizemore, I think. Sizemore. Yeah, Sizemore. Because I, I was running a 36 tooth sprocket, and my sprocket kept hitting the rail. This is, this is pre-micro drive, right? So Ooh. I'm running like a 36, 14. And I had never, Jesus. I had never tried a crank arm on any rail before. Like we don't have a lot of street skate parks where, in Seattle. Like if you think of Seattle skateboarding, you think of big bowls, right? Like we don't yeah. have skate plazas. Mm -hmm. Certainly not ten years ago, we didn't have anything. So there was nowhere for me to learn how to do tricks. So I was just like, you know, maybe a street ledge we could find a good one that was like pretty waxed up, and you could learn stuff on it, but. Yeah, I just like tried the crank arm. I had never done one before, and that was the rail that seemed like the least intimidating. There's grass on the side, and I just got wrecked over and over. Mm. Every time I fell, it was like basically a face plant, chest plant on the ground, knocked the wind out of me like four or five times in a row, and then I landed it. That's that's such a gnarly way to learn how to crank arm. Uh, what made you uh, what made you want to put pegs on eventually? Because I know you, there's there's footage of you out there with four pegs. Yeah, so the hold fast, uh, hold fast days. I switched to four pegs, um, and just do something new. I don't know. Oh wait, wait. What happened? To, what happened with Sky Limit? Why did you leave Sky oh, yeah, Limit let, for hold fast? Let's wrap that up. Yeah. So, um, so Sky Limit made the frames. Uh, we originally were trying to get solid to make our frames, and I actually believe that my sky limit was made by them um, because I, mine didn't have gussets on it. And what? So mine, mine was the prototype. The bike that I rode 
in any clip you've ever seen me of riding Sky Limit was the prototype. Um, and then I think we made another, we made Steven's prototype, obviously, and I think Matt got a prototype too. So Matt Spencer rode for Sky Limit pretty early on. Right. Um, and Matt just rode the SL1 like I was riding, so we were on the same bike, basically. Um, but then we got, Solid wasn't working out for doing a small production run. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of that. You know, I wanted, like, really nice tubing and stuff, and we are still able to get all the tubing. But then it went, um, Colby, being an SF, I think, connected with Brad from Nemesis Project to make them. And I don't know exactly all the things that happened there. All I know is, like, Brad, he would email me out of nowhere. Like, I, I, the only thing that I ever talked to Brad about was, like, here's the geometry for the bike. This is exactly what it should be. Let me know if you have any questions. Like, because I had made everything in BikeCAD and then, you know, had all the measurements of, like, head tube angle and all that stuff, what everything should be. So I sent that to him. And then a while later, I got, like, an email from him that was like, dude, you owe me, like, thousands of dollars. For, I made all these frames and, like, it's like... I was like, whoa, dude, like, you know, so I'm like calling Colby and like, what's going on, man? Like, we, you know, like, so I don't know. I, I don't, I honestly don't know what happened. My assumption is Colby asked Brad to make frames. Brad made a batch of frames and then didn't get paid for them. Maybe got paid, maybe got paid for some of them, but didn't get paid for all of them. And mm. Colby couldn't pay him for the rest of them. And so then um, there was that whole dispute going on. And while that was going on, I cracked my sky limit, which would not have happened on the production frame because I cracked it right where the gusset. Uh. So right where you're down to beat your head to. Um, and it's funny because it's actually cracked in a couple clips in the... The edit where I do the wall to wall 180, I probably broke it on that. To be honest, is it's um, prob is it is that when people stop being polite? I don't know if it's that one or a different. No, because I think when people stop being polite, that's the one where I do the foot plant 180, and then it goes to Chris's part right after that. Oh my god! Wait, and, real quick, that foot plant 180 is one of the craziest tricks in like fixed gear history, <laughs> like. Pizza, have you seen this uh, clip? Oh no, I had to see it. Hold on. Wait, what? Oh, I'll look it up after. Bro, he goes. So there's that famous you Seattle have to go spot. To the spot though, because like if you haven't ever been to the spot, you won't really understand how gnarly any of the tricks that anybody does there. Look, I haven't been to the spot, and I still think it's insanely gnarly looking. It's a huge bank, and then a huger bank, and then he footplant. Yeah, so <laughs> It's basically like a 45 degree bank that's maybe a 12 stair height. I don't know how big that stair set is. 10 to 12 stairs. So it's it's like a 45 degree. So it's like the same angle as stairs, right? And then uh -huh. that goes into a wall that's not straight up, but let's say it's like 80 degrees or yeah. 75 degrees. It's pretty steep, right? But people on BMX bikes can like hit the bank and ride up the thing and do like an air and come back down, right? So it's like, it's not straight up and down. And so like... That was when, I don't know if it's like a shred wheel tour. Dude, uh, all those guys, Wonka and those guys were like in town. Can't fool the youth to trip. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, because I wanted to see the other angles. I couldn't find where they're at. So thank you. Um, so they were in town. And again, I think that like competitive nature, there's a group of people. I want to like do something cool right. and get them stoked. Right. Uh, they're getting me stoked off of their riding. And so actually like everything that I did that day there, I'm like super pumped on because it's all gnarly. But that trick in particular... I had just tried to ride up the bank, hit the wall, and then transfer over the handrail to the flat. Oh, I to see the it. little yep. deck area. And oh, so I know like, what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, so like I crashed on it once and then I landed that and then I don't I or on one of the tries just going forward, I like took my foot out and just kicked the wall. Like just to save myself, you know what I mean? Because you're like basically mm -hmm. just like running into a wall and then you hope you right. get like a, a launch right. out of it. And I just was like, man, I bet you could just, like, kick the wall and do a 180. And then I just did it the next try. That's why everyone, well, you can hear me yelling in the background. Because they, like, 
didn't know what I was gonna do. I just went full speed at this thing and like did. I guess it's like a foot plant hard. Dude, I was gonna say it's like a hard the spin. Way, the way yeah. your back wheel went under your your leg was like crazy. Well, it was like a knack knack. So. Bro, that's some J ball shit. But like, I think I could do it, and then you just do it. Like that's. <laughs> Well, that's that's the same edit though. You you do your biggest wall ride like in like fifth gear history. That thing was fucking yeah. That, that huge. was huge. I was sick, but yeah, that day at Garfield, like I I did that. I did a uh, wall 180, which was like not that common at that point in time. I mean, granted, it's not straight up and down. Like none of the walls there are straight up and down, but it's enough that it's like hard still. Yeah, not a bank. And then I hopped off of the railing into the big steep bank. Um. And I did like some gap over. Yeah, I was just I was I was having a great day that day. That was a fun day. When when the the grime dudes were all there, uh, what is the interaction between the grime crew and the CSK crew like? Because I feel like on paper, because at the time I didn't really know you guys. Like you guys seem like really opposite people. Like how did that interaction go? I mean, it's kind of similar to, like, anytime you go ride with a big group of people, right? Like, I don't know that I was, like, talking with them a ton. We were just all, like, riding in the same spot and, like, cheering for people when you would land something cool kind of thing. Um, but, I mean, I'd ridden with, like, Ed and Mike and all those guys in New York back in, like, 2010, Bicycle Film Festival days. Like, I stayed with Tori. Tori wasn't there, but, like, I stayed with Tori out there in New York for a few nights. So... I don't know. I think fixed gear is a cool, it's really cool because like you would just meet people that you would never have met in life otherwise and be totally cool with them. Even though you're like vastly different, like I'm straight edge. So I don't party. That's like the polar opposite of a lot of people at fixed gear at that time. Cause everyone was super young and like just getting buck, you know, but yeah, we just ride bikes and I, I don't know. I just always in it for like riding bikes. Were there any any particular stories from that from them being down there or up there that you can remember? Because there's there were so many characters there that that trip. Yeah, I mean that's the only day that I met up with them. So um, I like I said like you know I was working full time and going to school. I think up until right around that time, um, I I had actually probably just dropped out of school. Uh, right around then because I dropped out before I broke my sky limit because I went to Ixt Fest with the sky limit. That was the one in Indonesia. And I, I had dropped out of school before I went on that trip. Um, cause I was already doing, I went to school for fashion design. I was already working as a fashion designer for a menswear store. And I'm like, why am I paying $27,000 a year to go to the art Institute, which is the biggest scam school in the world. Uh, <laughs> to get a degree to do the job that I'm already doing. Right. I already got the job. I don't need to learn anything else. So, yeah, so I, I, it was hard. Um, yeah, fuck Art juggling. Institute. Yeah, fuck <laughs> Art Institute, man. They suck. Um, that's, that's really cool. Were you, um, were you making money off of fixed gear at this time? I don't think I ever made, well, I mean, I got some money. Yeah, I got some money from writing, but not not anything. Like, I don't know if other people were making money. Um, I was, I felt really, like, fortunate and blessed to have people pay for me to go on trips. Like, I had some ideas for HL Sun. Hey, can you fly me down? Matt will make an edit. I got a trip out of it. They got an edit out of it. Um, Red Bull thing, like I was able to get down to the Red Bull contest. Um, Cole Headwear, I think, gave me a couple checks for you know a few hundred bucks, like you know. But it was always around. I've always, I was always under the mindset because you know it's not a big industry. If you're giving me money for something, I'm going to give you something in return. So like, you know, for Cole Headwear, I think like we did a giveaway contest together one time, or. Um, you know, leader bike, they would like fly me down to San Diego, which worked out really well for me because my family lives in San Diego, right? So I would get trips to go see my family that I wouldn't otherwise been able to afford. And then I would like film or go shoot photos with Lingo. Like we shot those inner bike photos on one trip. We filmed that shadow edit on one trip. So it was, um, I didn't get paid, but I feel like really fortunate to get to do the trips that I was able to do from fixed gear riding. But yeah, I mean, that makes it hard to, 
to ride all the time when you'll, you know, also have to work to try to, like, live like everybody else. Was there a, um, back, back to, for a little bit, when you were on leader, was there any kind of, like, team camaraderie with your other, with the other riders on leader? Or did you, it seemed like, in my eyes, you guys all kind of did your own thing, because you had Matt Spencer, Chacon, you, uh, maybe Kareem at the time, I think, like, there was a lot of leader riders, but I feel like I never saw leader riders, like, riding together. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I don't think any of us, maybe Matt in Chacon probably lived the closest, but Kareem lived in Atlanta. Uh, I lived in, when I was riding for leader, in Gig Harbor, so not even in Seattle. And, yeah, Matt and them were in California, and then there was Masson and... Eli, Emmy Brown? Emmy, Emmy, yeah. Masson and Emmy. So, no, there was not really, like, not that I had anything against those guys. I think Matt... Matt and I kind of maybe, like, started to become friends through that. But I didn't really know him much. It was more like, um, you know, maybe just chatting online or whatever. But, yeah, there was not really camaraderie there. Like, I didn't talk to the other people on the team about what was going on. I didn't know Mike Chacon at all. Like, uh, you know, not really. Um, but I was the, – the camaraderie for leader to me was, like, the leader family. So I was, like, Terrence was working for leader – Dan Arell was working for leader. Marcus was working for leader. And they were like the people that I would chat with or be emailing with. And they were all super cool. You know, Lingo. Lingo was like the photographer for leader. So, you know, Lingo flew up and like stayed at my house. So that was kind of like the camaraderie. It was less around the writers. Um, just because I think we we all lived in different places. So, Did you, um, were you in? Like, who was your biggest inspiration, uh, trick-wise, within the fixed gear scene at the time? Because, like, you're, in my eyes, you were kind of at the top of the scene. And when you're at the top of the scene, were you still, like, drawing inspiration from the other riders around you? Or, what? like, who, how, who inspired you, basically? Yeah, so, if we're talking, like, leader years, I mean, Keo, for sure. Like, Keo's the reason I started riding track bikes. Saw his fast Friday. Well, maybe not the reason, but I saw the MASH video. My friend Taylor had a track bike. And then I saw the Keo fast Friday video where he's doing basically like Keo rocks and stuff like at that point in time, like just nuts. And I was like, I never, I, you know, people, other people that were doing stuff were like track stands and backward circles and pogos. And this guy was like just smooth and making everything look like so sick. And that was like, oh, I want to do this for sure. So um, EO was definitely probably like my biggest inspiration. Like I didn't know anything about the East Coast guys for a while, for a while probably like a year and a half or so. Um, but because I had come from BMX, like bunny hops and stuff were normal for me and pretty easy. So like I remember the first night that Taylor and I built up my track bike, like I was able to bunny hop up curbs to wheelie that night because I'd already learned how to wheelie on his track bike. And then now I had something that he had like a track track bike. I mean, my Trek is a track bike, but his was like an NJS bike. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. not, not yeah. like tricks, you know, drop bars. Um, yeah. Like, and it was, it was a glued together lugged frame, not even brace. It's like this crazy <laughs> Italian brand. That's like, yeah. Glued lug. So it's like crazy flexible Ooh. as well. Excuse but, yeah. Me? So, <laughs> so Kia was definitely my inspiration in terms of, just like style and flow and like you know he lived in seattle so i would go i came up for like the fast fridays and he was there and it's like totally starstruck uh and i felt like super pumped because like my first fast friday i won the best trick contest and keo was like competing in it too and uh um, wow. i won it i don't know if you guys have ever heard of the wall of death in seattle but it was basically like this big steep bank but there's a curb at the top of it and i bunny hopped over the curb down into the bank Oh. And nobody had done that before on a on a fixed gear Dang. up there. Like people had thought about it for a long time. But again, like a bunny hop wasn't that crazy for me because like I could bunny hop on a BMX. The thing that's funny though is like all of the tricks that I've learned that are BMX tricks, I learned on a fixed gear. I'd never done a bar spin before. I'd maybe done a 360 and 180, you know, like on a BMX bike, like on flat, like a tap. But like everything, all the grinds and stuff that I learned, I learned on fixed gears. So even though I was like 
inspired by BMX a lot and kind of wove that into my fixed gear riding. I learned all the tricks on a fixed gear. So it's, it, I, I'm more comfortable for sure doing anything on a fixed gear than I am on a BMX trick wise. Sure. Yeah, so Keo was definitely my inspo, inspiration back then. And then to your point, like I was just always trying to think of like, how can I move the bar? Okay. Like, okay, so I can do a foot plant spin. Can I do a no-handed foot plant spin? Like, I think Keo maybe had done that. Well, if I can do a no-handed foot plant spin, can I hop over this ledge and land in wheelie and then do that trick? So I was always, like, if you look at a lot of my writing back then, it was lines, like, linking stuff together. Like, I'll link this pull spin to this, like, wheelie on this ledge to, like, this foot drag, you know? So I was, I was really trying to, like, link the tricks that I could do together. And then when it came to like more of the BMX era of fixed gear freestyle, who were your favorite dudes to watch around like the 2011, 2012 time? So that time frame, Tom, I mean, Tom and Tori, Tom LaMarche, for those that don't know, probably the greatest BMX styled fixed gear rider ever. Yeah. Uh, and oh, then so Tori, the just dude? so sick. Has, it has to be Tom or Steven, right? <laughs> uh, Steven's for sure the greatest BMX, like true BMX influence writer. But Steven was also a, basically a pro BMX writer. I mean, I don't want to take anything away from Steven's skills. He's done so many tricks that I'll never be able to do. But he could do all those tricks before he even got on the fix here. And, um, you know, Tom, I know, rode some BMX too. But, you know, he was in the fixed gear scene from the very early stage. Now, that being said, Steven can also do a bunch of trick track shit that nobody else can do, which right. is crazy. So I, like, totally I, – I, I hold Steven at the pinnacle of, like, greatest – Steven and J-Ball, I think, are probably the greatest all-around fixed gear riders. They can ride track bikes, trick track, tark, and fixed gear freestyle and make them look good on all of them. So – they yeah, but Tom Tom was the one that like if he dropped an edit, I watched it thirty times. You know what I mean? Like he he yeah. was for sure the guy that got me pumped. I mean there are other people like Matt Matt Spencer stuff. You know if he's putting stuff just because he was so clean. But if I'm just talking like pure excitement, I mean, you guys talked about I think in one of the previous podcasts that gap where he like shatters his back wheel and does the front wheel. Yeah. Like you know nobody nobody else was coming anywhere close to trying this, the gaps and stuff that Tom was. Even now, like his, his 360 that he did in that Toronto video, nobody's Dude. done a 360 that big. You know what I mean? That's so like a 10-foot big. drop. So big. Blew up the back wheel. like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but like, again, like his riding is, I mean, I guess in some ways kind of similar, but he was always like a more like balls to the wall rider and a little bit less technical. Um, and so, like, I don't feel like our writing's similar, but he's the guy that definitely, like, just, like, damn. He was always doing, like, stuff that I didn't think was possible on a fixed gear. And that is the kind of stuff that gets me stoked. Did you have a favorite, like, BMX writer from, from back then? Like, I know um, one of my favorite writers growing up was always Ian, Ian Schwartz, because he also rode Pegless. And, like, him and you, I always thought you guys had such a similar, like, bag of tricks. Be The way that, like... He rode weird spots, like, so much different than everybody else did. And, like, I, it always reminded me of you when you were riding Pegasus. Yeah, that's sick. Yeah, I, it's funny that you say that name because, like, I definitely remember watching a ton of his edits. But, like, if you had asked me, hey, who was that Pegasus guy that rode? He rode for, like, Odyssey and stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, I would never He was, like, one of, the first, one of the first people that rode Free Coaster, like, yeah, yeah. before everybody started riding it. Yeah, I, I definitely was, like, super into people who were doing creative stuff. So, like, him, um, like I said, I liked a lot of the mutiny guys. There was, a, like, Robbo and some of Matt. I can't remember his last name. He rides mountain bikes now. But they, did, they were just, like, super stylish and super clean. So, like, that was the kind of stuff that I was into is, like, people that make stuff look really good or people that are doing stuff that's, like, off the wall and unexpected. Poder, too, with, like, his peg list grinds. Um, yeah, so that time frame was definitely, I was, like, primarily watching BMX videos for the majority of my, like, once we got to 26-inch kind of era stuff, that was, like, what my inspiration was coming from. I think that was, like, a lot of most everyone else's because I feel like that's when we started to be real BMX-oriented and then just started to do, like, that's where all the inspiration comes from, for sure. Like, all the things that we're doing now are things that BMX writers are 
we're doing, I don't know, years ago, but we're finally catching up, which is awesome. But for sure, it's it's once the 26 hit, it's definitely more BMX oriented because that's that was like the goal to be like yeah. them to like, stop like trash talking us, you know? Well, they're fixies, but guess what? Like, look at this fixie just just barred a 10 <laughs> stair, you know, like Jay fucking hit El Toro on a fixed gear, you know, like crazy. Yeah, you know, so I, I for sure I agree. Yeah, I think that like. We kind of got a little lost in that period, though. Like, uh, we tried to do too much BMX stuff. And I like what I love about fixed gear right now is, yeah, there's obviously BMX tricks, right? And there's like DJ 26 inch Street Rider tricks. And then there's tricks where you're utilizing the fixed gear drivetrain in a cool way, like actually being able to fakey wheelie. You know, like on a BMX, you can fakey manual, but you can't gain speed. So it's like, if you don't have that speed going into it, then you're not going. But like, J-Ball can freaking just generate the momentum to keep going backwards. You know what I mean? So, like, I think in that time period, if I look back, like, yeah, I definitely jumped, you know, a 12 stair on a leader TRK just to jump it and, like, be like, yeah, I could jump this too, you know, or whatever. But, like, to me, that's not, like, fixed gears, the best representation of fix, what fixed gears can do. That was just, like, us trying to get... Yeah, kind of like some sign-off from BMX of like, yeah, you guys are doing cool shit. But at the same time, like the videos I was watching, I was watching BMX videos and going, I can do that on my fixed gear bike. Like pro BMX videos, I was saying, no, I'm going to learn how to do that same shit on my fixed gear. So like I was definitely taking motivation from them but in the sense of like, you know, jumping a big drop on a fixed gear bike, like a big drop, you're never going to make it look good. You know, you just, you have to land and pedal. You can't absorb the, the landing. So it's like anything above, I mean, even a 10 stair, anything above an eight stair probably is going to be like, not look that hot. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Unless you can kind of do it off a drop where you don't have to go like super fast. But yeah, I'm pumped on where, where fix your freestyle ended up. The, that era was a little, yeah. What 700 C before 26 era where we're trying to be a mix tricks was a little wonky. Yeah. yeah. For sure. What uh, you had a you had an absence for a, for a while from the fixed gear scene. What made you stop riding, and then what brought you back? Yeah, so Sky Limit ended. Whatever. I broke my Sky Limit frame, and they couldn't give me another one. And so to continue riding, you know, Colby was like, "What oh, you gotta do?" And that <laughs> sucked because I helped start it, but I'm kind of glad that I did because nothing got better after that point, right? But then I rode for Holdfast for a few years. Uh, shout out to Holdfast. Like, I was riding their straps before that. Those guys are the best. They're just super cool. Um, and, yeah, like, 2013 is really when I started to slow down on my riding, I would say. And then 2014 is when I stopped riding fix your freestyle basically um sorry to, like, to interrupt didn't you didn't you still hear or still uh be still edit come out in 2014 though yeah so like I, I, we we're still riding some but it slowed down a ton in terms of like how much i was riding right like i uh i didn't ride as much as most people because of because i lived so far away for a long time um and then when I moved to Seattle, I was working and going to school full time. I was like six or seven days a week was either working or going to school. So I was trying to leak up with Chris and Jacob like as much as I could, but they definitely rode like by themselves a lot of times without me. And then I would just kind of like join when I could. And then in 2012, I quit my job that I had been working for the last five years at, as a fashion designer at that store. Um, and that, why I didn't get paid very much, I got unlimited time off. So, hey, I want to go take this trip to wherever, San Francisco, Long Beach. You know, it was no problem, right? I, I just got time. I didn't get paid time off. I just got time off, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, so, because I could kind of do my job from wherever. This was like a little bit more before remote. So, um, that was 2012. So, then I like went, we filmed the, the Toda Street edit. Um, in 2012 in Long Beach, and then we filmed the um, 23- early 2013, we went to film the second H-plus Sun edit in Long Beach, and I hurt my knee. 
Yeah. And so that was early 2013. I had no job at that point. I started another job and then I was going to quit and the boss found out I was going to quit and fired me. <laughs> and so then like I had no job. Uh, so then I was like, well, you know, to get a little bit of money, like, can I go film this edit? And then, you know, like just a couple hundred bucks. My rent at that time was $600 a month. So I didn't need much to make, you know, rent. It was, it was a great time. <laughs> Very different than now. Um, and so, yeah, so like I went down there, hurt my knee five hours into the first day. Like they picked me up at the airport, built my bike up. We went out filming and then I was in the ER like five or six hours later. It's uh, what, what actually happened to your knee? So I tried that tree ride and I just jumped off the back and my peg just landed on my kneecap. Now where it landed, I had actually ripped my kneecap all the way open before. So I have a scar going all around my kneecap. Um, and so I think because it was scar tissue, it just was able to rip through it maybe a little bit easier. But it basically like poked a hole down into my knee. And so I had to get stitches, but it was really deep. And I'm pretty sure that it poked a hole, like, or, like, messed up the ligament or tendon that's under there, too. Um, because my leg hurt for a long time, like, a year and a half after that. So that's part of why, like, my riding slowed down. Plus, I had, like, life changes in this point in time. Like, um, you know, Chris and, Chris and Devin were, like, getting close to getting married around this time frame. Jacob was basically working, like... 90 hour work weeks at Safeway. Like it was just the, so we were like, weren't getting a ton of time to like ride as a group. And I, as much as I like to just like go riding by myself, I just am not motivated to try stuff alone. Um, Fair. You know, parking lot riding is way more fun alone than fix your freestyle riding. Sure. But yeah, so that was like 2013. And then I got a real job. And I was working, you know, 40, 50 hours a week. How, how old are you at this time? Uh, so it's 2013, so 26. So, and this is where the same company I'm working for now, Zulily. Zulili. So we sponsor the Seattle Sounders. Maybe you've seen the logo on the soccer team. But yeah, so I've been working there for nine years. And it just finally felt like, a, you know, like a lot of things were changing. I wasn't seeing my guys that I was riding with as much. Yeah. You know, I was kind of like, uh, moving in a different direction in life. Like, I, I just became a Christian at that point in time, too. So, like, I was getting really involved with the church that I was going to. So a lot of my free time was, like, kind of wrapped up in that and volunteering and doing music at the church and doing, a, you know, other stuff. Um, and we just weren't, as a group, we weren't riding as much during that time. Uh, we continued to film a little bit over that year, me and Chris. Um, and that's kind of how we finished that uh, Hold Fast, Be Still edit. Um, wow. And that came out in 2014. And that was kind of, like... Basically, I was done. Bef I was done writing kind of before we even finished that edit. But there was a couple things that I wanted to get, like that. I think the last thing was the long crank arm. Yeah, that was so sick. Clip. Yeah, yeah. So that took like three day three days of going out to the spot trying it to get it. Dang, um, I need to see the. Uh, I need to see the B sides from that edit. Do those still exist? I don't know. Chris might have them. Maybe he filmed all of it. I I, I never had a camera. I mean, I had that GoPro, but that, that was like out of date the moment I bought it. So I didn't really ever like film much, you know. Um, was your was your yeah, last uh, was your last who raw on a bike kind of like stay strapped or were you riding after that? No, that was definitely like I I still had my fixed gear like in 2014 because I rode it in stay strapped, which I think. We probably probably filmed in 2014, but I think maybe it came out in 2015. I'm not sure came exactly when it came out. But, yeah, I mean, like, Matt came to town. And, and I was still riding a bit um, during that, but not not as consistently, right? It would just be like, oh, Jacob and, and whoever's going to ride, like, I'll go link up with them and ride. Um, but I definitely wasn't, like, super, you know, on it to ride. How did you – um? So then that fizzled out, but uh, you seem that you, it seems like you have a fire, like a fire lit under you now. I mean, you've gotten three bikes in three months and you're coming out to Long Beach uh, later this month for the competition. What, what brought you back? Hold on. I'm going to turn my brightness down. My battery's getting low. I just texted my wife to bring me the charger. <laughs> sure. We're going to be going, going all night long here. So, um, yeah, sorry to your question. So the, 
you know, I think some of it is like time, you know, period in life, right? Like, you know, I kind of got into rollerblading, like I always wanted something to do. Um, and like, I'm just really into a lot of what people are doing now in fixed gear. Like, I think it's really cool that there's kind of like people that ride track bikes, but still do tricks. People that kind of ride tark bikes and are doing tricks. And then people that are riding fixed gear freestyle and doing tricks. And um, now more than ever, everyone's able to kind of like ride together. And that disappeared from 2008 to 2014. Like all of the people that came and just hung out and rode fixed gears because they liked riding fixed gears were not into riding a 26 inch mountain bike and trying to jump down <laughs> stair sets. You know what I mean? So we like really separated apart like right. the group and so i just thought i mean like i've been seeing everybody's stuff i've kind of always watched like the videos over the years when people drop stuff that i'm following on instagram and you know i've always loved watching um what people can do and yeah i think just kind of like seeing everything you know right right time in life i've been feeling like pretty nostalgic and like bummed that i don't have like a shadow frame and that i don't have my sky limit frame and so like to be able to build the size more back up which is like built it up as close as I could to like how I had it at the Red Bull ride in style event. Um, it's kind of like a, you know, I'm 35, but which seems old to me for bike stuff. Um, but it's about how you feel kind of like, yeah, it's true. I feel old though. When I, oh, when I ride. okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> or after I ride, I should say. Um, so, yeah, just seeing everything, following all, every, you know, the stuff on Instagram. You sent me all like, you know, you're, I was like, who some people should I should follow? Yeah. Um, sent you a long list of. A long list of like really awesome dudes. And yeah, it's just sick. I mean, it's cool to see like dudes on straight up track pipes do cab fives. Dude, all the Korea. It's like it's like everybody born in Korea is comes out the womb knowing how to five cab. It's crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. Uh, so yeah, just you know. I'm in a point in life where it's like, I wanted to get some memories, bikes back together. Um, and then, you know, just like we live two blocks away from a really shitty local skate park that I've been posting in some of my clips. Um, so I'm, you know, I have like space to do it. And yeah, I just was like, now's a good time. Like, I, I think I struggled for a lot of those years of like, deciding whether or not I should have just went and became a pro BMX rider. Mm. <laughs> Which maybe like sounds weird or arrogant to say that I think I could have like been pro at BMX, but I just assume if oh. I had spent all the time riding a BMX bike that I spent riding a fix your bike, that I would be able to do at least some good enough tricks to get like sponsored. I, you know mean, I mean, so you, right. I, you're not wrong in thinking that I've seen clips of you on a BMX and you look very comfortable. You're pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty comfortable for sure. Yeah. Like even there was years in the CSK era, right. Where I was like half of my clips are on a BMX bike because I was like torn in this world of like, we're just doing BMX tricks. Should I just ride right. a Like, should I just try to ride a BMX bike and try to get sponsored for riding BMX? Like volume gave me a frame and stuff at, at one point when I was writing for them, uh, for resist, I think it was like discount. They didn't give it to me free, but you know, they totally hooked it up. It was sick. Um, and I was like, kind of like exploring, like, should I do this? And I think that now that I'm a little bit older and maybe it was just because of that era of like battling with BMX and like BMX riders looking down now, BMX riders are like stoked. They're like, Oh, that's sick. You know, like if I go to a skate park, there's always BMX riders there. They're like pumped on the stuff that I'm doing on, on my bike, right? It's like a pretty different world now, I think, it's, in some it's sense. It's a whole 180 on what, how, their view used to, how they used to view us back in the day from now. Like we can go to vans and like all the BMX riders are like, they see Jay and they're just like dumbfounded. Like how the fuck are you guys doing this well, on this yeah. big ass bike? You know, it's it's <laughs> Jay Ball. <Yeah. laughs> Chase, bro. But yeah, Chase. it's... it's it, Oh, well, Chase too, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's crazy to think like that that's how we were like 10 years ago. They literally hated us or like they mocked us or like, but now it's current day, like today. They're so stoked on everything that we're doing. It's it, They're like, holy shit. And they, they try and write it and they're like, no, like they give it back immediately. You know, it's it's funny to see it happen like that. It, it helps that Adam 22 isn't just like talking consistent shit on it on his blog also. 
<laughs> like, I yeah, feel like that that's didn't another help. part of it. But I think, you know, like, they recognize, like, they know that it takes skill to do the tricks you do when you're at the Van Skate Park, right? right? Because you're doing, you know, wheelie 180 bar into a bank and, like, nobody's manual 180 bar into that bank except for, like, pro BMX riders, right? Yeah. So they understand now, I think. A lot of them have, like, tried to pedal one and they get it. So I don't know. I think, like, in that area, it's, like, kind of, like, again, just feeling, I don't know, self-conscious about, you know, the fixed gear stuff. Again, like, there's a lot of, like, as pumped as I was on my Sky Limit edit, there was, like, 200 comments on it that were, like, fixies suck. This is the stupidest thing ever. And then, like, <laughs> 10 comments that were, like, that was pretty cool. You know, so it was it was a different time. So I think I always kind of, like, struggled with that. But now I'm, like, you know what? Like, I enjoy writing fixed gears. I think it's fun. I think it's sick what we can do on them. And I also think that we've kind of found a good balance of, like, you know, yeah, there's still BMX tricks, but I also think, like, people are doing stuff that, like, you know, links things together that are a little bit more fixed gear specific. I mean, nothing's really any bike specific, right? You can backwards right. manual on a BMX. You can backwards wheelie on a whatever dudes on mountain bikes can do, you know, trials guys can do anything on any bike. So it's kind of just like bike tricks. But, yeah, so that's kind of, like, how I, I've been getting back into it. And then, yeah, I got the mash frame, super stoked on that. And then I kind of remembered that Chris had the size more and I was like, well, I just want to build that up just to have it. Like I, I plan to like hang it in my office, kind of like somewhere at some point when I get a nice looking bike stand. And then uh, the blue bike I got back, bought it back from Kareem. So I had that bike built for me in Maybe December or November of 2014. So at the know, tail end of, of like, your riding. Yeah, I was still kind of. I, I wasn't like all the way out of it. 2015 is, I think Chris, Chris got married, for sure, and they had their first kid, and so he like wasn't riding at all anymore. Jacob was really in the thick of working. I mean, I cannot stress how much Jacob used to work. It's insane. I'm so glad that he has a different job now. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that permanent vacation, I mean, that's, like, you know, was when he quit his job and just took a sabbatical for, like, mental. Oh, that's mental why it's called that. Yeah. I mean, that's my assumption. I haven't asked him, but knowing him, that's what I'm, you know, it was filmed during that time period where he, like, quit his job. Um, and I'm so happy that he did. But anyway, so, like, we just, like, weren't riding, right? So, like, <clears throat> we tried to ride a little bit, but it's hard to ride in the winter in Seattle, man. Like, you maybe get one day that's dry a week and then if nobody else is free to ride that day then you like what you go ride by yourself i don't know that's not super fun right especially fix your for yourself but yes yeah, so i got that i designed that bike and made it and i was trying to get jacob to start csk frames with me basically but jacob also got a prototype his was basically I think the only difference was that his seat tube was maybe a little bit shorter and it had a little bit different seat tube angle, but it's pretty much like the same overall geometry. And that was his first <clears throat> raw one that had the brakes. Oh, yeah. You guys remember that? Yeah, I do. So they, yeah. so they were made by Stout. So, like, I just call this my, like, Rough Bike Co. knockoff because <laughs> this was, like, prior to Rough Bike Co. It was kind <laughs> was of, bad. like, what, an impetus into that world for Jacob. But, yeah... So I, I like built this bike up was super sick. I rode it for like two months and then sold it to Kareem to for his brother, for Kareem's brother. And I think he shipped it to Atlanta for his brother and then his brother ended up moving back to Seattle. And I just hit Kareem up like after I kind of started getting back into it. I was like, hey, can you see if your brother still has that bike? Like I knew he never rode it. He wasn't like a fixed gear freestyle guy. Yeah. And frame was basically in the same condition, two months old. and just been in storage for there we go. For seven right. years. <laughs> yeah. New and, old dog. <laughs> straight up. And you, I, we were, we've been talking a lot since you got back into fixed gear. And I remember you told me before you got that, that you had no plans on getting a 26 inch fixed gear freestyle unless you could get that exact bike back. Yeah. What am I going to buy? There's, there's options. I, there's like Kareem would. There's sh not a rough bike co available. There's not a master frame available. Kareem surely the has only backup. Two bike companies that exist. Ugh. Do do you have do you have any plans of uh, or desires to still produce a frame? Because it sounds like in the past you've had lots of desires to produce frames. 
Uh, not now. There's no point. I mean, like we we have uh, reached the end of iterations. I I mean, you you can do a little bit of changes, right? If you want something to feel a little bit different. But we're at the point now where the geometry, just like BMX bikes, like the geometry is set. You know, one brand might like like it a little bit different than another brand, right? I'm, I don't think Master and Rough are the exact same geometries for their bikes, so they're slightly different. <coughs> Cream has the <clears throat> the chainstay yoke, you know. So there's differences, but um, we're not in the needing to continue to develop things in that same sense. So I don't I don't know that I have anything to offer from designing a new frame that uh, you know Rough and uh, master have already you know accomplished like they're they're both amazing bikes um, so, so you so you only have desires to innovate it sounds like i mean if i'm talking about designing something yeah otherwise what i'm just going to copy the rough geometry and then what call it a different bike i don't know like i mean that's what every bmx company does right yeah yeah but if you think about like you know sunday's developing tubing for their bikes right they have that crazy wave tubing yeah. where the down tube doesn't dent. Mm. You know, not all bmx brands are that way right like every colt frame is basically the exact same as a fit frame which is the exact same as an s m frame which is whatever right but the trends change over the years right so everyone's seat tubes are getting longer in bmx whereas fixed gear we don't we're not we're, we like just reached kind of the end of the pendulum i don't think I think the way that we've swung back is that there are kids jumping stairs on aluminum track bikes, not that we're trying to change our 26-inch bikes back to 700C right. and X bikes. You know what I mean? Like right. the, the modern-day fixed gear freestyle 26-inch bike works the best that it'll ever work right now. I think the, the trend stuff to me is the handlebar thing, right? Rough making freaking seven-plus-inch <laughs> handlebars is wild to me. But yeah, seven and a half is a lot. I never went that route for a reason. <laughs> it's yeah, so, so hard. I have, to... I have the six point fives though, and they feel so nice compared to the five, seven five S and M bars that I had on there. Like it definitely is nice to ha to not be so hunched over. For sure. Yeah. I think six point five, in my opinion, is the perfect handlebar height. Six point five gang. <laughs> six point six point five think, gang. Yeah, proportionally, it looks. Style looks good, that's, yeah. That's I, I mean, you know, what what size bars does um, Marco ride? He seems tall. Yeah, he, he has a seven five. He runs the seven, uh, yeah. The he's lock boy. He's on the two wheel uh, gang bars, seven and a half. Yeah. Are those yeah. like uh, wheelie wheelie guys? Uh, yeah. Wheelie bike bars. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are. But they work. Uh, that's you know one cool thing about the the bike life scene is that they're producing parts we can use in a scene where we don't have very many parts so that's cool uh, i don't have any parts <laughs> hey man i put together a buyer's guide there's some stuff on there yeah but nothing that you would actually buy for your 26 inch fix your freestyle bike oh i mean when, Car when kareem restocks we'll have parts right and when Ruffco restocks we'll have, starts. We'll have parts but it, it it really it really, really it is really coming full circle though because I can't tell you how many pe how many like track bike kids I've been seeing breaking their aluminum stuff lately. I'm like, this is why we stopped riding that stuff. Yeah, they right. don't know all the history. Of, they don't know how many different bikes I rode over. You know, <laughs> I, it seems like I rode fix gears forever to me. But really, like, if we're gonna say that I ended at the end of 2014, let's just use that as the the stopping point. It was only six years. So from 2008, riding <laughs> right. A, right. Trek, a Trek track bike with a carbon 650 wheel that I spent $350 on on eBay and broke in two days. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> to a custom-built frame that's basically what we're riding now. Mm. Like, this is pretty – like, this was 2014, but it's basically what, what everyone's on now. Yeah. It's pretty similar. Um, was only six years. So think how many iterations there are. I had my Trek, I had that Leader 735, I had a, at least two or three TRKs that were different bikes. <laughs> Probably like four or five different Leader forks in that time frame, and then the Shadow, and then the Sizemore, and then the Sky Limit, and then the Hold Fast, and then this thing. We went through 20 years of bike, of bike progression in six years. <laughs> 
and the craziest thing is like all of us like pizza and ice generation did the exact same thing like we we all built like regular track bike broke it built a you know big wheel track bike broke it <laughs> built a 700z broke the wheels like, yeah and i think there's like there's a natural progression there right not everybody nobody start well i don't know anybody that's really started on fixed gear freestyle 26 inch bike like that was their first fixed gear i don't really know anybody that's done that you kind of get like the track bike or the fixie right like that to me long beach is like the capital of the fixie world like uh, like 300 400 dollar fixie with some white deep v's on it yep. city grounds i feel like probably retrospect like million dollars of them <laughs> all right <Yep. laughs> city grounds man all right you so you buy this cheap shitty fixie and then you're like oh yeah people wheelie on these and oh you can kind of jump and you start seeing some stuff but they're not going through the extent of like 29 or 2.1 tires right, right. like they're you know, the, the yeah. kids are either just like sticking with track bikes and keep breaking them or like that Max kid, he's kind of like more Tark. Like he has like a steel frame. I don't know what size tires he's running, but they're a little bit bigger. Right. Yeah. And then, or, and that's like kind of that middle realm or it's just full on 26. Like nobody's going from that Tark world <clears throat> and then slowly iterating over to fix your freestyle. They're just going to buy a fix your freestyle bike if they decide that that's what they want to do. Right. I think we're yeah. saving a few steps at least yeah they don't yeah they don't have to go through all the steps they they just yeah we we were the guinea pigs for sure like i mean uh, you so many, for sure, the yeah. natural progression so many broken wheels the natural progression was that you broke your like track bike fork and then you get a trick fork on your track on your aluminum frame and then you'll and then you're like oh, i can't jump stairs on this aluminum frame i'm gonna break it so then you get like a volume cutter style frame or like a liter trk Yep. Which would probably break faster than a normal aluminum frame. Yeah. <laughs> no, I never broke any of those TRKs, but again, what? I didn't break it. I didn't break too much stuff. I swear, Mike Chacon said he's broken like twenty. <laughs> Which is crazy to me because, like, I don't think of him. I know he's jumped a couple big sets in his time. Like, I think he did like a big fakey set one time. That was pretty cool. But, um, like, I don't picture him as like a Ed Wonka. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's. He's not like a thrasher. He's like smooth spinning guy. So, yeah, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. I never broke a single liter. I bent about a million forks. Yeah. Like we, I, I went down to shoot photos with Matt Lingo on the brand new TRK, that blue one that I had with the chrome forks. Yeah. Um, and we went out, and my second or third attempt at a trick was a 180 off this ledge into a grass bank. And just the forks immediately bent so far out. So like, oh my God. I don't know if you remember those photos. Like, there's one of me like on DJ Mole's white leader doing like a bar spin to fakie, and then there's a couple BMX. I rode DJ's BMX bike. Like we shot like I don't even know if we shot a photo that we could have used from that day. So like leader flew me down to San Diego, to build up my new bike, and I bent the fork the ten minutes into riding it, and. Ended up having to ride somebody else's bike. You, forks, were, forks were the soft spot there for you, later, I feel like. You rode, um, you rode for Resist as well. Um, was there any ever talks about you riding for volume? I'm surprised that never happened. No, because I didn't get on Resist until I started Sky Limit. Mm. And I wasn't going to... I wanted to do Made in the USA, so I, wasn't, I wouldn't have ridden for for them but resist was dope those guys were super cool you know gave me parts when i needed them during the time for, i mean they made the best fixed gear freestyle tire in my opinion that's ever come out yeah same it's i think it's such a great tire it's the only one we, ride. we all still ride all of us still ride it <laughs> yeah i have a i have a rear um but i have this like wild super rare schwalbe supermoto 2.4 but it it's a they make the supermoto, but this one was made the way that they make high-end road tires. So it's super light Ooh. pacing. You know, normally you run a 2.4 26, and it's like same thing. Too much rotating momentum, so you can't like bar spin well. You can't you know do 360s and stuff well. That's why the resists are so great. They're super light. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you can you can buy some now. Buy some nowadays, which is crazy. And now they're they're, they're just actual 26 inch demolition momentums. Yeah, which is sick. I mean, that's the bike life influence, right? So, like, yep. Colt, <clears throat> Colt has their 26 and 29-inch tires. So I have 
have the Vans tires on the Sizemore 29er. Um, <clears throat> I think that's sick. A lot of the tires, though, aren't, like, very good. No, it's what so I noticed. Cru- cruisers, for sure. <laughs> Beach cruiser tires. Oh, the cruiser, yeah. Yeah, because I had the... Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, yeah, they're most so... They're just built for cruising. It's like, like Colt, like, those things... I wish, like, I was I was trying to ask... I forget who I was asking earlier. I was asking about that new Colt tire they came out with. I was like, are they going to make... Oh, it was Foo. I was like, hey, are they going to make those? Because those are sick. Like, those probably... Those things are light. Like, I love the tread. It's flat on top, you know, for speed. Or, And he was like, no, I just... There's no need for them because they already have the regular Colt. But, like, I mean, that one is just built for cruiser. Like, it's so heavy. It's, it's like, like as well with, like, the the Primo tire. Like, the um, the one with the X's on it. Same thing. Yeah. It's it, it's it's huge. It's two point five, and it thinks. It's, it's, yeah, it's but heavy. that tire was is heavy on a BMX. That's right. that tire is from the '90s. That V wall yeah. Primo tire. Like I had that dirt jumping when I was like ten years old, and it weighed four pounds. So that tire's always been heavy. But yeah, totally. Like I rode for a little while in 2017, I think. So somebody from Holdfast, I bought one of their like old completes. Um, when I was trying to get back into it. So again, I think like at this time frame, you know, Jacob was maybe hitting me up more. We were trying to like start riding again a little bit. We actually filmed some stuff, but I think it all got lost on a tape that he had. Oh, sad. Yeah, it sucked. Um, Eating tapes. But I had a I had a fixed gear during then, and that was one of the bikes that got stolen when I had those four bikes stolen. So that was that was actually <clears throat> the I. Oh, okay, so I got that hold fast, which was a complete, and then I reached out to the guy, Matt. Um, so the, the dude who made the, this blue bike and the original Jacob's, like, d- prototype bikes when he was kind of what became Rough Bike Co. Uh, it's called Stout Bikes, and he's based out of Texas, and I don't think they're taking orders anymore. Um, at, at he still, like, he still does. He still does. Yes? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's sick. Um, if you're going to have him build you a bike, make sure that he crimps the shit out of your chain stays because he does not like to do it. And so you won't be able to put your sprocket on. Uh, but his quality of builds is great. Like he builds really good bikes. That's the only downside. It's just the, the chain, the sprocket thing. But uh, he, he does that, seem like a craggy old man, but he's, he makes great stuff. Yeah. Um, so he built me two frames. He built me this blue one. Sorry. Which is actually... The geometry that I designed, and he built another one before this that was made for a 420 fork. But I was this is a 410 or whatever, and I just emailed him like in 2017. I was like, "Hey man, you know, I'm kind of thinking about building up another bike." And he's like, "Oh, you know, I actually have that frame that I built for you that was for the 420 that I never I never ended up selling it. Like it's powder coated black. Do you want it?" So I bought it from him. So in 2017. Uh, the bike that got stolen is one of those bikes that I designed. It's basically the same geometry as this with a little bit longer fork. But yeah, so that was a bummer that that got stolen. So that also put a stopper. Like, I mean, there's only so many fixed gears you can build, in, in especially in the 2017 time frame. Like, there were, I don't think anything was available. 20, so. 2017 Maybe. was super dead. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know anything that was available. Uh we're um we're actually coming up on a uh, on our time here, but uh, before we signed off, uh, Tyler, I I asked beforehand if you had any topics you wanted to bring to us because you know usually this is a topic formatted show where each of us bring a topic for the for the episode. So I want to know if you have any topics for for us to discuss to end out the night. Yeah, I think what I would love to get your guys' thoughts on are. Where do you see fixed gear freestyle going from here? So that could either be like youth, like somebody that you see that's going to carry the torch. It could be like a company and parts thing. It could be like what you want to see ideally. But to me, like, I think we all agree that it's like fixed gear in terms of riding, fixed gear freestyle is in a cool spot right now. There's a lot of different aspects. All of it's sick. People are riding parking lots. It's sick. People are doing park ledge stuff. It's sick. People are doing straight up insane pro BMX level tricks on fixed gears, and it's sick. But 
what do you what do you kind of envision uh, the next six years to look like for Fix Gear Freestyle? Damn, the next six years. Damn, D, can you I, go first? I really if we okay. think about how much stuff changed in the first six years. What are we thinking the next six years is going to look? Like? All right, I got it. I got it. I want to see every kid with the aluminum frame stuff. I want to see them watch J Ball ride Tark and then go try and do all that stuff because, like, I feel like J Ball gets no shine for how good he is on a Tark bike. <laughs> The best. Like nice. every single one of those kids is like, oh, they've seen you know Steven Jensen's you know Tark bike edit, but they haven't seen like that J Ball is still making up NVDs like to this day he's still making up NVDs on a Tark on like a Tark bike, and it's like he's been riding Tark since like 2010, 2011, and like doing crazy stuff and making videos like it's all out there. Go watch his stuff and then go do it because like I feel like. So many people were, are just stuck in like the Matt Reyes era still. And it's like, I want to see more people branch out of that. And then from there you can, you know, it's like, it's the sky's the limit. You, you have so much bike control and it's like, that's what I want to see is, is more diversity. You know, you know what? You I'm that's because of time though. No, go ahead, Tyler. You think that's because of time riding though? I, Maybe, but it's like also most of just... these kids haven't been riding for years, right? Yeah, like two years or less, probably. But it's still like I I feel like a lot of these people are coming from backgrounds where they see you know they see their friends do one trick and they try it, and then it's like I want one kid in every squad to just be like, dude, did you see that J Ball did fish and chips to reverse fish and chips? Like, you know, like let's all go try that, you know? But it's like I I see like. Homie learns full cab, and then instead of learning other tricks, he learns how to do 20 full cabs. <laughs> good at them, though. You know, you know what? I, I think part of, uh, part of the reason why the Tart kids are kind of going in that direction is because of the wide bar uh, trend. You can't really oh, do... Can't. And bar spin. Yeah, you can't do a lot of those bar spin variations with such wide bars. So... That's my personal take. I don't understand take. that trend. I mean, like, if you're just a straight-up masher, I still don't understand it because you can't even fit between cars. Wider <laughs> bars make sense. You don't need to be running the, like, hands <laughs> next to the stem thing that we were doing in 2008. Like, no way. Still got like, that. 30-inch bars just doesn't make sense to me. I don't get it. Yeah, it is a it is a funny a funny thing that's evolved. We've literally gone from polar opposite to polar opposite. I'm still I actually put the small bars back on my trick track uh, recently because it's just like you can just throw bar spins for days. Like it's so fun. It'll never hit your knees, but it looks funny. So that's the trade off. Pizza, um, pizza. Where do you see uh, where do you see fixed well, gear going? So it's it's kind of it's kind of like it's kind of weird because I know like our generation, me, Jay, and Deacon are kind of like the last of like a couple that still actually ride FGFS, still have a good amount of you know our bikes are like you know top tier, top of the line right now, and a lot of kids nowadays are kind of just getting a lot of hand me downs, and it's kind of discouraging for them just because you know they're not always going to have the best of things and it's always going to fall off or it's like what deacon me or deacon talked about things are just going to break and they're not going to they're not going to have a new place to get them from you know and so it's kind of just going to like bike life is cool because you know it's creating some parts but it's not creating like frames like we have like master rough you know the forks that are actually taught you know relatively good uh, you know aside from the colt fork and uh, other things like that. Yeah, they have parts, but I, I, some I, I don't. I mean, in six years, that's that's far. But <laughs> I, I think it's. I think there will be some. But I think I don't know if FGFS as a whole will still be as popular or as big as it is right now. Um, just because I think I think it might just evolve it evolve dissolve into like a lot of Tark or. If who knows, it might just be wheelies, <laughs> but I, I I don't see it. I, I mean, I, I have hope for it. You know, that'd be fucking awesome if, if there's FGFS still riding you because you know me. I'm growing up, you know, 27, whatever. Uh, James, James the same in Deacon, but you know, we only have who knows. You know, just because it was weird that this whole thing sparked. I'm gonna say it. You know, because of COVID, everyone's inside and they're like, I need a fucking bike. I want to get out again. You know. And so, 
it's great that it sparked everything again because it's COVID and but yeah, like you like you guys said, from twenty seventeen to twenty twenty, there wasn't nothing there was nothing. Like nothing I you know, I didn't even think about it, you know. I just came back because of you know, I just twenty twenty came I came back and I was like, dude, fuck yeah, I'm trying to go back out there, I'm trying to ride, like I need something to do while everyone's fucking stuck inside, like I don't wanna do that, you know? So now we can ride our bike and now there's options for us to have. Thank God, you know, fucking Ruff came back. They brought their, they had frames. Uh, Kareem Master, you know, he brought a whole, uh, uh, another set of, of frames that come out. That's awesome. But, you know, as far as the six years, man, I don't, I, I, I have hopes, but I, I don't know how far, how far, how far in Del, Del Deep it'll be. Still, it's FGFS. It's probably, like I said, it's probably might just be Tark or something. I mean, yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of my, Spiel. Wow, that's very, uh, very optimistic yeah. of you. Yeah. Hey, I mean, I have, I have, I mean, just like I said, I have hopes. You don't you know? believe in Young Chase, bro. You don't believe in Young Chase. Chase will carry okay, the like entire Chase, young, scene on his back young, in the future. Young Chase, Young Chase is about to dump, drive into the the e, the e bike business. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I think I get what you're saying. Like, if the kids who are riding Tark bikes don't continue over to end up on a 26 inch fixture freestyle bike. You know, there might be still people that are riding, you know, J-Ball in six years will probably still be riding 26-inch fixed year freestyle and just right. doing stuff that nobody can comprehend. But <laughs> if you don't have young people coming into the sport, so like rollerblading is having a big resurgence, right? Like COVID, yeah. same thing, huge, huge resurgence in rollerblading. And they're starting to get kids into it again. And kids are the people that huck themselves down big shit. Right, they're right. They're willing right. to hurt themselves. And, you know, like if you don't have kids coming into your sport, yeah, you're probably not going to have much of a future. But to me, I kind of view, like, when I say fix your freestyle, I don't specifically mean 26-inch. To me, it's like somebody doing tricks on a fixed gear. Yeah. Like, I would love to see the full spectrum. And I think as long as somebody's making bikes and hubs, Master Bike Co. or Rough Bike Co., people will still ride. It's just probably be, I mean, I wonder how many people even ride 26-inch fix your freestyle right now. Less than 1,000. Yeah, I'd be really interested to know that number too. Less than a hundred? <laughs> more than a hundred. More than a hundred for sure. Yeah, for sure more than a hundred. Yeah, I'm sure Master sold over a hundred frames. So maybe like less than five hundred in the world. <laughs> That'd be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I I think so. I mean, uh, hey. I mean we have a good a good group all around, you know, SoCal, NorCal. We have the guys that are always posting from I know a couple guys from like the Korean the Korean guys. Uh I know because all the old guys are coming back. And yeah, exactly. Back, yeah. I'm riding again. All, all, all I'm you saying like is that Schmidt. there's over 22k people that follow SMC on Instagram. Like, some portion of them have to ride a 26 right. inch. For sure, for sure. That's 20,000 bot accounts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buy. How about you, Jay Ball? What do you think? Six years from now. Uh, I think. I think part of the problem with production right now is the fact that like things are so hard to it's it's hard to get shit produced right now and I think that's part of the problem and I think it'll only get easier over the next 6 years to with the manufacturing and and supply and materials and stuff like that and hopefully master and rough keep taking the initiative to make more stuff also we can't forget destroy destroy came back right. shout out so, to yeah. destroy shout out to destroy for sure yeah, yeah. Uh, but I actually had a conversation today with, uh, good old Montana Ricky, uh, Tyler, do you know who that is? Yeah, I just started following him. Uh, I was talking to, I can never remember his, his Jimmy, Jimmy, watch out, watch out or whatever. Watch oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just chatting with him on Instagram about, um, that he's like sponsored by Merit or like gets a hookup from Merit or whatever. I was like, cause I bought Merit cranks because I saw that Merit was, kind of supporting the fix your freestyle scene. So I was like, these okay. guys are putting some effort into the scene. I'll spend my money with them. Like I'm a big profile guy, you know, like I've, you know, I sponsored my profile at one point. I love profile products, but that's cool. they don't care about fix years at all. Right. So while they make some hubs and stuff, and I think that's sick that they still make some of that stuff, uh, you know, they're yeah. not supporting it. So I, I thought that was cool. So yeah, I just follow, started following that guy uh, this week. Actually. So you'll, you'll actually, you'll actually get to meet him. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's right. coming. He's coming out. So Montana, Montana Ricky is an absolutely insane person. Uh, 
love I fucking love the guy though. He I had a conversation with him today. It was like an hour long conversation, and he's talking about he's talking about a lot of shit about about bringing a lot of sh- shit to the table for fixed gear and and he wants he likes he loves the twenty six inch fixed gear scene, and he loves the bike life scene and he wants to make. He wants to make a lot of things, and I think with the the influence he has in the scene and the connections he has and the pull that he has, he can uh, he can really help the supply issue that we're facing right now when it comes to everything. And it sounds like he's the type of guy who, where he says something, he means it, and I just hope that's the case because he says he wants to make frames. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Not getting my hopes up yet, but... I think if that's the case and we as long as there are parts available then people will be interested and I think the whole cycle is going to happen again where I broke my fucking track bike and I'm sick of breaking my track bike so I'm going to buy the fucking freestyle bike Nash Reyes but but work like their way over but like do you ever think that we'll actually see like the age we had at city grounds where you could walk into city grounds but like damn like a thrasher completes right there yeah yeah I think we will you know why we'll ever have it you know why? Because I'm going to make that. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody starts... I mean, there's a there's a fixed gear only bike shop in Portland. Now, they don't carry any fixed gear freestyle stuff. But, you know, like, it, it has to be somebody who loves doing it. I don't know that the people at City Grounds... Maybe you guys know them. I don't know them. Were like... To me, that was just like a bike shop that was like following the trends. Yep. And then they like hired some people that were probably into fixed gear stuff. But they were just like a company that like made money, right? It's not like, you know, if J-Ball were to start a bike shop, for example, right? He would carry the stuff that, you know, that's a little bit different. It's like Goods BMX, which is run by yeah. Shad, right? Like he's a BMXer for life kind of thing. But, you know, J-Ball, to your point about like the bike life thing, like I don't know why their frames would need to be any different than what we make. Like the frames that we have are the best geometry for doing any kind of tricking. Yeah. Wheelies are not. I mean, our right? rear ends are shorter than what they're running. So they, uh, you know, like that's to me, saying. that makes sense, especially when you have a genius like Kareem, you know, that's coming up with like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I'll just make <laughs> one hub that can be infinite configurations. But you know what I mean? Like you could make a complete yeah. bike life bike. Right. That's, right. that's 26 inch BMX geometry with brakes with a convertible hub, 14 millimeter. Everything else is the same. Why wouldn't they want to run a 28 knot, a 28? nine or twenty eight ten or twenty five nine whatever gear ratio and have their stuff out of the way you know what i mean like make that bike you can sell it all to all the bike life kids and then you can sell it complete to all the fix your freestyle kids and it's all the same parts and the only difference is the hub coasts or it doesn't coast right? yeah Which, it's crazy you say that though because the radio the old bomb track actually makes something like that but like it never like i recommend it to people because if you want to you know, a 26, the closest thing to is freestyle bike, and then with, you can, I see, shit. Don't, don't buy it, guys. Buy it. Buy it. What are you it, talking is about? Is it really the right geometry and stuff, or is it just a bike that's kind of similar no, no. to what we would want? It is. It's no, Elliot's, no, it it's is. Elliot's Zion frame, but repurposed. Oh, okay, so that's the bo- Without his track. name. <laughs> Without his name. He got no monies. <laughs> but, yeah, like, the only thing that you would have to change with that is you'd have to just buy a massive bike co up. You have to buy a massive bike. Yeah, but it needs to come that way. It needs right. to come with the hub. Yeah. It come with, you either can buy the configuration, but the way that I see it is it comes with brakes on it, and it comes with the free wheel, and then you get a little baggie that has your fixed gear driver, and you just put it in there, and that's the only thing you have to change. And it probably sure. needs to be a minimum of 6.5-inch bars, right? I think the Bike Life guy is probably like a little bit bigger bars or whatever. But, you know, you find that like sweet spot in the medium, and in the kind of median world there and i think you could sell a few thousand of those bikes pretty easy right i think so i think so too we need a p fix back thing to me is that is that like the wheelie bike and bike life bikes are so expensive for what they are like bro they're like 1300 dollars for a pk ripper PK rippers are 1300 dollars and people uh, just know PK ripper you're buying you're buying the name like <laughs> se's been around forever and ever right so like you're buying you're buying this this like especially the older guys right they they probably rode the se's in the 80s the bmx mm. bikes it's the same right. thing but i mean you're looking at a minimum of a thousand dollars i would say like 999 for for a complete is about where you'd probably be at. Just, everything costs just so much more to make now. 
Like it's just it is what it is. I, but, go, you know what's what's a normal BMX complete? I know Colt makes some cheap cheaper level ones. But what's their average? Like seven hundred bucks probably. Yeah, like seven hundred. Like five six hundred. Yeah. So five, if if you five, also six. think that they're probably producing, you know, thousands and thousands of that complete bike, right? Versus you know, maybe if, let, let's say that Montana Ricky guy gets into it and they make a bike company and they're able to produce a thousand complete bikes you know maybe they can get it for around eight nine hundred bucks but to me like i would rather spend a thousand dollars and have good rims and have good handlebars and have good cranks and all that shit than get it for six hundred dollars and break all that stuff and then spend another six hundred dollars to buy new parts well i think i think where we are now we can all agree with you in that sense but when i was in you know like high school you know, the cheaper option was better. Like I was down for a PK Ripper then, because it's cheaper. And I, I'm like, I'm not that good yet. I'm not gonna break shit too much yet. I just, I just feel like I'm, I'm crazy. There's, there's no way back in the day these bikes were that much. They weren't. Especially, which is the city. You know, remember, like, there was a fixed gear PK Ripper complete. It had chuckers on it. Yeah. Yeah, it was four hundred bucks. Yeah, it was super cheap. How much was the P fix? <laughs> the P fix was like nine hundred bucks though. Uh, P-Fix was six hundred, six six fifty. Six, like yeah. Way. Six, yeah. yeah, I bought it, was, it from it City Grounds. It was crazy yeah. cheap. Six fifty. Yeah, was it was the, like six fifty. How much was the bomb track? The bomb. That was, was like eight hundred. Bike shop that had it. Yeah, yeah. And it was like eight hundred in Europe. Yeah, yeah, like? yeah. Eight hundred bucks. I mean, so then maybe maybe that tar- maybe that's the target range, six fifty to yeah. eight hundred, depending. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the parts that you put on it, right? Yeah. And if it's somebody who's already involved with the bike company, so like I know he's part of Merit and some of the other like Throne or some of these other like, it's probably going to be a lot easier for them to produce something in a price range that is more reachable. Um, so I mean that sounds sick. I love that idea of like, I mean I you know our geometry is sick on our bikes now. It's the best. For sure. It's the best. Yeah. So, for sure. It feels like oh, a BMX. Nice. But you still have clearance. You ain't getting crazy toe overlap, right? I don't even think they make. Does anybody make sizes anymore? No. <laughs> just one size, right? So it's like they don't even offer top two blanks. You know what I mean? So you don't even have to make more than one size of a frame. You can just make everything the same, which that's gonna help with cost. All I'm all I'm saying is that I'm not as disappointed in bike life bikes geometry as i am disappointed in street mountain bike geometry <laughs> what's up oh. with that man why are they doing this to themselves <laughs> so there is no street mountain bike geometry the ns makes some ns bikes actually make some legit made for street mountain bikes and then there's that guy jeremy he probably has a custom frame that the rise or like some small batch frame but those bikes are dirt jump bikes. They're made to be run with a 435 axle to crown fork. They're yeah. made to be ridden and jumped over 40 foot gaps and double backflips and shit. Like they're not what I would consider a BMX style bike. I they're know. mountain bikes. That's what I'm saying though. Style. Like there's a bun- there's a big 26 inch street mountain bike scene kind of. Like probably bigger than fixed gear freestyle and i'm just surprised they haven't like tried to change I that know. i feel like it's pretty small now it used to be like when fixed gear freestyle was pretty popping like yeah they were like in more street stuff I think they just switched to bmx do you think there's more there's more 26 inch mountain bike street guys than there is fixed gear freestyle guys or no it probably is europe has a ton of oh yeah well this kind of Europe. it's true because sure. europeans love that shit I mean, I've never seen a person riding a 26-inch ma- street mountain bike full rigid. You know, I think same. I, never, I know there are people that do it, but I have never seen one riding it. I mean, I had a dirt jumper. I just sold it not that long ago. Like, I had a, a bike that's similar to that. Uh, I've never seen somebody with, like, a straight-up rigid fork. Yeah, know. true. Uh, my, the geometry makes a lot more sense with the suspension fork. I'm not like I've had a dirt jumper too, and it's it's fun, but it's it's like it's not as fun as what we do. <laughs> Think about it. it makes it's me... made for jumps. <laughs> yeah. It's made for going off of steep lips and go you know going twice as fast as we ever go on our bikes. Really, you know, for the most part, it's not made for grinding ledges and doing nose manuals and and that stuff. Yeah, that's true. I mean it. 
The suspension fork also helps when you case too, because it's like you, you don't just get like the body shattering effect of casing with full rigid fork, you know, like full rigid bike. Yeah, the funny thing is those guys pump up the the guys that are really good. They pump up their forks so hard that they barely move. So it's it's it kind of cracks me up because I'm like, oh, why don't you just run no suspension? It's like almost a rigid fork at that point. Yeah, but that's kind of like you know the mountain bike world is. Yeah, it's a little different. I know. I mean, it moves. Some of those guys ride full suspension bikes, but I'm just saying their their suspension is like if you stood on it and you jumped up and down, it's not like going, you know. What I mean, it's like barely, right. barely moving. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think that uh, I think that wraps up our uh, our time here on off track. That was a solid two over two hours, boys. We got pretty off track there. We. <laughs> Look, he gets it. let's go he gets no, it this guy gets no, it no uh tyler thank you so much for being our first guest on uh you have so much insight into the scene and i'm so excited to continue seeing your clips that you'll be putting out and i'm excited to see you in november for our suck my comp ah. five uh which, uh, if you're listening to this, you should come out to. It's going to be a big fixie party. There's going to be a Fode Gang premiere afterwards. That's not announced yet, but you're hearing it here first. And, whoa! Uh, whoa, whoa! I know. Uh, Tyler, any shout-outs before we sign off? Yeah, just, you know, got to shout-out you guys doing what you're doing. I think it's sick. J-Ball, Fixie Archive is just, like, unreal. Uh, single-handedly like stoking my interest back in history. and also showing me edits that I've never seen before just let's go pretty cool uh, and you know Jacob and Chris you know I I didn't film a single thing ever over the years I mean like maybe one or two clips if Jacob or Chris wasn't there but so everything that you've ever seen of me was because they were out filming I probably would never have put you know any of those video parts out and just been right in doing that stuff without filming it without them so what? have to have to give the csk fam a big shout out yes, um, yeah and yeah just sick sick to see what people are doing shout out rough bike co destroy master thanks for making making what you're making and kareem big shout out to kareem dude's a freaking genius man he yeah it's like true the I don't kareem. Stuff, so the master That's hub it. one hub one hub fits all Hopefully, right, it's baby. Hopefully, everybody can run it. Hopefully, they restock soon. Uh, off track podcast. Uh, follow us on Spotify. Listen to us on YouTube. Uh, all of the above. Subscribe. All that good, good stuff. Uh, thank you so much, Tyler, for coming on. And until next time, guys, take care. Adios. Woo. Let's fucking go. That was two hours Ew. and ten minutes.